Okay. We'll go ahead and get started. I trust everybody had a safe and enjoyable Memorial Day yesterday. A uh, Monday, I'm sorry. Uh, this meeting is called to order. The school board of, of the Duval County School District is convened in a board workshop. We will now take roll call. Board member Anderson. Oh, good morning. Here. <laughs> board member Grimes. She's not here. Board member Hershey. Here. Board member Joyce. She's not here. Uh, board member Smith Juarez. I'm here. Board member Willie. Here. Five members present, counting myself. Waiting on board member Joyce. I think. Uh, Board Member Grimes uh, would not be joining us today, as I'm told. Uh, public access. This meeting can be accessed by the public online at www.duvalschools.org backslash board. The meeting can be viewed locally on Comcast Channel 212, or it can also be viewed on WJCT Channel 7.4, and a digital antenna would be required. It is important that the public use one of the above remote ways to access the meeting. If there are any problems or questions about gaining access to the meeting, the public can call 904-390-2126 and leave a name, number, and a brief message. Topics to be discussed, school reopening update, Lift Jacksonville, shelter, preparation, and governance. Uh, with that, Dr. Green. Good morning, Chairman Jones and the board. Uh, first, we'd like to do the Duval County Public Schools Hurricane Preparedness Shelter uh, during COVID-19. I'm going to ask Director Edwards to come forward and make that presentation. School board members, Direct can everybody hear me? Um, yes, Director Edwards, we can uh, barely hear you. Okay. Okay, I will talk louder then. Let me turn up. I uh, turn up my mic. Yeah. yeah, much better. Okay. Okay. Um, once again, um, good morning to Dr. Green and the board members. I would like to give you a presentation this morning on the status of all hurricane preparedness, more specifically, all shelters. Um, operating hurricane shelters in a COVID-19 environment. Um, I would be remiss if I did not um, share with the group this morning that we have been collaborating with our um, shelter partners, which consist of the Emergency Preparedness Division of the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department, as well as the Jacksonville Sheriff Office, um, the American Red Cross, um, the City of Jacksonville, um, Division of Disabled Service, the City of Jacksonville Animal Care and, and Protective Service. Um, in addition to that, we've been working with JTA and we've been working with the Jacksonville Department of Health. Those are the individuals that my staff and I have been collaborating with um, in, since um, about two to three weeks to, to come up with this overall plan. And again, this plan is continue to evolve, will continue to evolve based on the changes in uh, the guidelines that we're receiving from the CDC, as well as our um, Department of Health here in Jacksonville. So with that, I would like to begin by just kind of giving you uh, what the forecast is for the 2020 hurricane season. They are expecting um, 13, to name, 13 to 19 name storms. In addition to that, it, with those name storms, they are projecting that six to 10, between six and 10 will become hurricanes. And of that number, three to six will actually be a category three hurricane or higher. Um, remember category three hurricane um, is a hurricane that has the maximum sustained winds of 110 to 129 miles per hour. 
Again, um, they are expecting between 13 to 19 named storms, about six to 10 hurricanes. And of that, they are expecting between three and six hurricanes that will reach the category three uh, higher level. So with that, we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, what you have before you now is our general population shelters. These are the eight schools that represent our general population shelters, and they are Landmark Middle, Twin Lakes Elementary, Chimney Lakes Elementary, Mandarin Middle School, Ocean Way Elementary, Avis Park Elementary, Andrew Robinson Elementary School, and Arlington Middle. And these eight schools um, in our, for our general population, um, they can hold up to a maximum capacity of 15,200 residents during a hurricane event. Um, next, I would like to move to the next slide as we talk about our special medical needs shelter. And um, the three schools that we utilize for our special medical needs shelters are the Atlantic Coast High School, Ocean Way Middle, as well as Enterprise Elementary. And our maximum capacity um, for these three location is 900, is 900. What's not reflective on this map is that we do utilize the La Villa School of the Arts for our homeless population for the city of Jacksonville as well as our beach communities. And that particular shelter can house up to 1,200. So when you look at our general population, special medical needs, and our shelter for our homeless population, we can accommodate up to 17,250 individuals. Can we go to the next slide, please? What you have is our recent hurricane history for Jacksonville. Um, if you notice that we've had to deal with hurricanes three out of the last four years, starting with Hurricane Matthew in 2016, Roughly, we sheltered approximately 3,000 individuals between these 12 shelters. And then fast forward to Irma in 2017, where we sheltered another 3,500 individuals. And last year, we had Hurricane Duran, where we sheltered approximately 800 individuals. But if you go back to the year 2017, where we sheltered roughly about 3,500 um, individuals, that only represented about 21% of all maximum capacity. Again, we can hold up to 17,250. And 2017 was the year we had the highest total of individuals that utilized the shelter. And again, that only represented 21%, which means we had 79% more space available for other individuals. So with that, uh, we'll move to our next slide. And this next slide, this is the district um, phase approach as it pertains to hurricane shelters. We have a four phase approach. Phase one is known as our training phase. Phase two is preparation. Phase three is managing, managing these hurricane shelters. And phase four is restoring our schools back to their normal condition. So let me talk about phase one first, the training phase. In previous years, what we have done is that we'll provide training only to those principals that served as host principals, host principals during these hurricanes. So this year, the game plan is to provide training to all of our principals so that we will not have to have principals work more than 12 hours, that we will have the ability to rotate individuals in and out between these 12 dedicated shelters. So with that, uh, my staff will be providing training. We hope to begin this training in June of this year. And the training will consist of is familiarize, familiarizing the principals with the concept, the concept of national incident management system, which is known as the NIM system. In addition to that, we will familiarize them with what is unified command. Uh, we will share with them how to manage evacuation shelter, how to go by requesting equipment and supplies, um, and then most importantly, how to complete the FEMA paperwork so we can get reimbursed um, for all efforts. And last but not least, one of the things we will be doing is that we will be providing up-to-date COVID-19 guidance 
end requirements based on the guidance that we will be receiving from the CDC as well as the, the Duval County Department of Health. So they will be receiving this information on a timely basis as well. So with this, that will consist of phase one, which is our training phase. And we hope to get this completed in the month of June. Phase two is our preparation phase. And phase two would normally take us between three to four days for us to be able to accomplish phase two. Phase two is, is where we have our warehouse staff where they will deliver to these 12 schools, all the cots, blankets, mattresses, hand sanitizer, paper towel, toilet papers, and dog cages and other supplies that they may need. In addition to that, our maintenance staff will begin installing our shutters, um, and that normally would take about three to four days. Um, they will also be delivering sandbags to those schools that normally have a flooding problem. So that will consist of phase two, and that takes approximately between three to four days for us to be able to accomplish that. And next we'll move to the next slide where I'm gonna focus on phase three. And I'm gonna talk about the changes for this year versus previous year. Some of the things that we will be doing different to operate in the COVID-19 environment that we are currently in at this time. Um, each client, work and visitors will have their temperature taken prior to entry into the shelter. Um, that is very key, is that before these individuals will be allowed entry into the shelter, they will have their temperatures taken, and the temperature will be taken, taken by a member from the Department of Health, as well as a representative from the Jacksonville Fire and Rescue Department. In addition to having a temperature check, these individuals will have to complete a questionnaire before they can enter the shelter. Some of the questions that will be posed to these individuals will be, have you, um, have you traveled out of the country within the last 14 days? Have you tested positive for COVID-19? Have you been around anybody that have tested positive for COVID-19 within 14 days? So those individuals will have to have the temperature check and they will also have to complete this questionnaire. Once they are given the the goal to enter the shelter based on their temperature and based on the way they answer the question there, they will be allowed inside the shelter. Those individuals, once they enter, enter the shelter, they will be given a surgical mask that will be provided to these individuals. Um, what I would like to do is back up and tell you uh, what is the game plan for those individuals that when we take their temperature, that it is above the level that the CDC and the Department of Health um, requires those individuals, and again, those individuals that answer that they have traveled out of the country and that they have tested positive for COVID-19 or they have been around somebody that have tested positive, those individuals will not be allowed into our shelter. Let me say that again. Those individuals will not be allowed into the shelter. The only time those individuals will be allowed in, in our shelters if the hurricane is approximately an hour to three hours away and we cannot safely transport those individuals to the most appropriate shelters. One of the things that we would do different this year is that we would de dedicate two additional shelters, one on the east side of the river, one on the west side of the river. And those shelters will accommodate those individuals that have tested positive for COVID-19 those individuals that have traveled out of the country within the last 14 days, and those individuals that have been around somebody that have tested positive for COVID-19. Those individuals will be directed to go to those shelters, and if they do not have transportation, then they will be provided transportation by a private rescue service. So again, if those individuals do not pass that screening process, they will be in directed to go to one of the COVID-19 shelters that would be on each side of the river. And those particular shelters will be staffed by the Department of Health, as well as the city of Jacksonville will be contracting with other medical providers to run those shelters. And my staff, we will provide the security at those shelters as well. 
So I want to make sure that I share that information with everybody. In addition to that, at our regular shelter, they will be taking temperature checks of all the occupants at least twice a day. Um, one of the changes is that we will be adjusting the number of available shelter space based on CDC guidelines for social distancing. Um, in the past, we provided at a general population shelter, they have been provided 20 square feet per person in a shelter. But because we are operating in this COVID-19 environment, that number has been increased from 20 square feet to 60 square feet. So what that means is that pretty much all total capacity be, will be reduced about 60%, by 60%. So we have 11 additional shelters that we have on standby. If it gets to the point we need to open additional shelters, we'll have the ability to be able to do that, to be able to accommodate these individuals. So again, uh, we will be um, adjusting the shelter space and part of the preparation phase is that we will go into all these shelter location and we will mark we will mark this 60 square foot at each one of our shelters um, for the individuals to know this is your area that you are required to remain in unless you go into the restroom or performing any other function. Um, one of the great things is that we will continue to allow families to congregate together. They will be allowed to do that and they will be receiving meals throughout. And again, this is um, through a contract that the American Red Cross have with Chartwell. Chartwell will provide meals to the occupants of the shelter. And the last bullet on this slide that I really want to emphasize is maintaining regular, san regular san san sanitation. I'm sorry, sanitation. Okay, if you would, can we go to the next slide? Cleaning and sanitation, this part is going to be very, very important. I mean, um, when you look at our game plan, our game plan is to strategically place hand washing stations in the shelter areas. They also place cleaning supplies around the facility for clients to maintain cleanliness of their individual areas on a daily basis. We will have frequent cleaning and janitorial service should be used. Uh, with special attention to our high touch areas such as tables, doorknobs, light switches, countertops, handles, desks, and those other things that's noted on the slide. One of the recommendations that we're requesting that we increase our janitorial, our custodial staff at the shelter so that these functions can be performed on a daily basis, but on a frequent basis. In addition to that, we will provide alcohol-based hand sanitizer throughout the shelter. So those are some of the changes this year versus um, our previous year's operating shelter. And can we go to the next slide, please? And the next slide is phase four, which is restoring our, our schools to the normal condition. And this normally would take us anywhere between two to three days to accomplish this. This consists of having our warehouse staff return to our schools, remove all the equipment, our cots, our mattresses, blankets, and dog cages, uh, and, and any additional supplies that needs to be picked up. One of the recommendations that we have for this year, we have to stand up our hurricane shelters that we do deep cleaning. And we did that in the past, but we're recommending that we do that at least twice. After we, build, after we do the deep cleaning once, the recommendation is that we will go back and do that deep cleaning again of all the areas that was utilized for shelters in the school. And for us to accomplish this task, all, the timeline is roughly between two to three days, two to three days. And with that, that concludes um, my presentation on all hurricane preparedness, operating shelters in a COVID-19 um, environment. And one of the things I can tell you is that my staff and all the additional partners that I've named at the beginning, we are continuing to meet on a regular basis. We know that we will continue to make changes on this, on our game plan uh, moving forward but I will continue to share information with, um, with Dr. Green as well as um, other staff members um, as well. So with that, I will entertain any questions.
I have a, I have a quick question through the, through the chair to the chief. Um, what what and that that thirty five hundred in two thousand seventeen. Which which storm was that, and how long how long were those folks in that shelter? Do you remember offhand? Um. Yes. Yeah. In two thousand seventeen, that was Hurricane Irma. Um. And those individuals are. Uh, um, the majority of the time when individuals are in a hurricane shelter, they're probably there from anywhere between 24 hours to 48 hours in, in a hurricane shelter. Um, off the top of my head, I don't have the exact timeline that they was in that shelter. But again, that was in 2017. And that was during the time where we had the most people that actually utilize our service. But again, that only represented about 21% of our capacity. Got it. And was that that was due mostly to more more flooding than the actual storm, right? Oh, yeah. Most, yeah. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Let let the record show that uh board member Joyce has joined us. Thank you. Good morning. Uh any other questions? I don't see any hands. Uh board yeah. member Joyce and then uh Smith Juarez. Um, I'm sorry that uh I had an issue getting in. The link didn't work for me, so I apologize um that I, I'm late. I don't have any questions because I missed the presentation, but I'm going to go back and look at the PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Board Member Smith Juarez. Thank you. Um, through the chair to Chief Edwards, uh, we typically have um, designated shelters. Uh, I, I heard you say that we will have designated shelters east and west for those who. Um, are flagged by the screening. And I appreciate that that's being done by health professionals, whether that be an EMT or a, a public health department official. Um, and so those health professionals will be the ones who are deciding um, who needs to go to those designated East and West shelters, which I think is appropriate and great. Um, we also typically have shelters for those who have particular medical needs. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about um, if there will be differences in those shelters if individuals um, are in a high risk category or are otherwise medically compromised, are there particular um, you know, instructions for them as to how they should approach sheltering during a hurricane? Um, yes, through Chairman Jones to um, Ms. Smith Suarez, um, yes, I can address that. And yes, our special medical needs shelter, we will still have the same three, which is Atlantic Coast, Ocean Way Middle, and Enterprise Elementary. And one of the good things about our special medical needs shelter is that they are ran by our Department of Health, so they have medical staff at those particular locations. Um, but the most important thing um, that, I, that I failed to share with the group is that um, Prior to the shelters opening, the city of Jacksonville will communicate to all residents that if they are, if they test positive for COVID-19 or if they um, have left the country within the last 14 days, if they've been around anybody that have tested positive for COVID the, the last 19, they will strongly encourage those individuals for them to shelter in place at their home. And for those individuals that does require um, the special medical needs um, treatment, those individuals, again, if they do not need to be hospitalized, then those individuals will be allowed to come in our special medical needs shelter. We all know these individuals have to register through JEA. So the Department of Health is familiar with their condition. So they will constantly be checking these individuals throughout the day and making sure that we do social distancing for those individuals. For our special needs population, in the past, the distance was 120 square feet. So that distance is increased to now 240 square feet for our special needs so that they can accommodate their belongings as well as family members. So they have doubled they have doubled the space between our special needs patients uh, for this upcoming um, hurricane season. Okay, thank you. And, and I heard you say, um, as we know, that, that those individuals who have those particular medical needs actually register prior to checking into the shelters. So I just want to clarify um, for the public that if um, you are in a particular risk category for COVID-19, you would need 
that that would not necessarily qualify you necessarily to go into a medical needs shelter that you would need to pre-register and, and pre-apply, correct? Um, yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. All right. I, I, I just will say quickly that I, I really appreciate um, everything that staff is doing to implement these procedures to prepare. Um, I do have one other question actually, but um, it, you know, this is always a difficult time for us um, and always a time where we have to be nimble and flexible um, and really coordinating with our partners at Jack's Fire Rescue at the city, um, at JSO and others. And I, I know this year um, increased coordination with public health and with hospitals as well. So. Um, thank you, Chief Edwards, to you and your staff for all that you are doing. The one other question that I do have is, have we received all of our FEMA reimbursements um, from Dorian and from past hurricanes at this point? Um, through, through the chair to Ms. Um, Smith Suarez, um, I do not have the answer to that, but if, if um, Vicki Schultz is on the line. She may be able to answer that question. Or it looks like maybe the superintendent was putting her hand up. Did I see that correctly? Yes. <laughs> to the chair to Ms. Smith Juarez, no, we have not received all of our money from FEMA from Hurricane Dorian. And Thank you. Um, and, and do we anticipate um, needing to make expenditures to be prepared um, for these particular circumstances? Are there things that you anticipate that we would need to do um, in order to be able to operate the shelters? We, we always, we, we pay up front and then FEMA reimburses us. Um, and I think, you know, the average is a couple of years um, to, to get those full reimbursements. So are there expenditures that we are anticipating needing to make um, in order to be prepared for this hurricane season? Through the chair to um, Ms. Smith, Board Member smith is nothing out of the ordinary. So whatever expenses we would normally incur, that is what we're expecting. Uh, as Director Edwards stated, it takes us three to four days to install the shutters on, on our facilities. So some of the costs would be overtime. That, that would be an incurred cost. The cost of running the shelters. So right now, we're just anticipating our normal costs if we were to open up shelters. Thank you. So I just want to emphasize the point that annually we have regular expenditures that we make to prepare for a life-threatening weather event. So we anticipate what we think may happen based on the National Weather Service and others. Um, and we go ahead and make those expenditures so that we are ready for a life-threatening event that may come. Um, and so as we anticipate other life-threatening events that we currently have, we're changing protocols in our shelters. And we are also making preparations for what we think we may need um, due to the COVID pandemic that, that, that we're currently under. So thank you, Chairman. That's all I have. All right, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Anderson and then uh, Board Member Hershey. Thank you, Chair Jones. I'll, I just have a quick question. Um, Chief Edwards, you referred a couple of times to the questionnaire. And so I just want to reiterate, um, where is the questionnaire coming from? Who's developed the questionnaire? Um, who will administer the questionnaire? Um, and, and if you will remind me who is going to staff the shelters that will be in place for those that may be compromised. Um, yes, through the chairman to um, board member Anderson, um, the questionnaire will be provided to us by the Duval County Department of Health, and it will be a combination. Um, the questionnaire will be administered by the Department of Health as well as representative from the Jacksonville and Fire Rescue Department 
those are the individuals who will do that screening as well as the temperature check. And if an individual, based on the way they answer the questionnaire and or maybe what their temperature is, then those individuals will not be allowed to enter the shelters. Those individuals will be directed to go to one of the COVID-19 shelters on, on the two different sides of the city that we have. And those individuals, if we're dealing with a situation where the hurricane is like an hour to three hours away, those individuals will not be turned away, but there will be an isolated area in each one of our shelters to accommodate those individuals until that hurricane safely pass our city. So that is the game plan um, for dealing with um, individuals that may be compromised. Uh, there may be some questions about their medical conditions. And, and the COVID-19 shelters, are those schools or are those other types of facilities? No, those, those COVID-19 shelters will actually be two of our schools, and we will designate one on the east side, of, east side of the river, and one will be designated on the west side. And again, those shelters will be ran by the Department of Health, as well as um, contracted medical providers that the city of Jacksonville will um, contract with. And, and my staff and JSO, we will provide security and we will use all the appropriate PPEs to make sure that our staff are safe in these, um, in, at these COVID-19 shelters. Okay, thank you so much. I just wanted to make sure that um, those, those buildings will be staffed and reiterate that that is not gonna compromise our um, our Duval County staff and put them in that situation and um, to affirm that the questionnaire is not something we have developed, but it's developed by healthcare professionals to make the appropriate assessments and will be administered and decisions will be made by the healthcare professionals. So I appreciate that. I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. This is certainly going to be an interesting hurricane season. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board member Hershey followed by board member Joyce. My comment was really a follow-up to Board Member Smith Juarez, which is, uh, and I, she may remember this a few years ago, we were trying to get money from a hurricane and, and found out that, in fact, the federal, that it had been released at the federal level and was held up at the state level. Um, and I was just wondering if enough time has passed that we might need to, do we need to follow up, Dr. Green, or are we on schedule as far as uh, getting the funds back, or do we need to follow up at the state and federal level to see if those funds have been released yet? Through the chair to board member Hershey, uh, I know Michelle is not on the line this morning, but I know through her office and through our risk management, they they do follow up periodically. So I just don't know where we are today, but I know that they they are in contact with the state reminding them these are our uh, costs and uh, trying to ensure that they don't forget that we haven't been paid. But I just remember, I think it was Hurricane Matthew. Uh, we actually had to get our state senators involved and that expedited the process. We got our dollars pretty quick after that. I will do the chair to Ms. Hershey. When Michelle returns, I'll follow up. Okay, is that a uh, board member Joyce? Thank you, um, Chair Jens. <clears throat> and I apologize again for, for not being able to get in. And this may have been covered um, during the presentation, but I had a couple of questions. I know that um, Dr. Green had mentioned that there would be no additional cost um, to the district, but I do, was as I'm looking through the PowerPoint, um, I am seeing some that masks, for example, will be um, supplied to all of the um, uh, all of the um, clients that will be using this shelter. There, and then there would also be some additional sanitation. Um, so I was, my question is, if there's no additional cost to the district, where it, where are these supplies coming from? Is, is that something that the city, the state? Will be providing to us or is this something that the district will have to provide to the shelters 
um, through through Chairman Jones to board member Joyce, um, the hand sanitizer as well as all the equipment that we use to stay off our shelters, that inf that those supplies and equipment is provided to us by the city of Jacksonville at no cost to the district. The only additional cost that I foresee is again, is gonna be with additional staffing um, that will be needed, but that cost will not take place unless we stand in a fall shelter. So from additional preparation, um, I do not see any additional cost because that those equipment and supplies will be provided to us by the city of Jacksonville. So they will cover the cost of those equipments. Okay, thank you so much, Director Edwards. Um, and one more follow-up question. I'm curious what, and, and again, I apologize that I wasn't here for the presentation, but in the case or in the circumstance where um, during the, the uh, time that the uh, clients are in the shelter and someone does start to feel sick or there's some issue with, you know, maybe some COVID related symptoms. Um, what is the plan? Obviously you can't move them to another shelter. So what would be the plan in that case for anyone that would start feeling ill? Um, yes, um, through Chairman Jones, the board member, Joyce, um, again, each one of our shelters will be staffed with medical personnel, and we will also have an area designated as an isolation area. So if there's individuals there that start demonstrating symptoms of COVID-19, then those individuals will be safely moved to those particular locations, and depending on the impact of the hurricane, we may have the ability to transport those individuals to other locations. Um, but again, it all depends on um, the time before the hurricane actually impacts um, the city. So, but yes, we have thought about that and we do have a plan in action is that that's why we will have an area isolated um, for these individuals as well as we'll have medical staff at each one of our shelter locations to provide the necessary treatment. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? I have one, uh, Chief Edwards. Um, the number you gave us of 17,250, uh, the number of people that we can accommodate, that number does not include the Legend Center or any other uh, shelter that the city operates. Is that correct? Um, yes. Um, um, yes, Chairman, um, that does not include the Legends Center. In the Legends Center, they can only accommodate 250 on the general population side, and then they accommodate another 60 special needs. So that's additional 310 um, spots for the city of Jacksonville. Okay, and th those are not included in the 17,250, though? Um, no, sir, th that number is not included in that 17,250 number that I provided. Now, the homeless population that goes to La Villa, is that included in the 17250? I wasn't clear on that either. Um, yes, sir. That 1200 number is included in all um, the overall totals. Okay. All right. And I appreciate the work, um, the, the amount of work that goes into opening and operating and closing these shelters. It primarily rests with this uh, school district and uh, Appreciate your leadership and direction on that. Uh, very thorough, and uh, hopefully we won't have to use it this year, but you gotta be prepared anyway. Uh, Board Member Willie, you had another question? Yeah, um, I wanna echo all the sentiments. I got a chance to sit in on a, a meeting. Um, Councilwoman Jacoby Pittman had a meeting just about, because her area actually has a good number of the low-lying areas that are highly affected by a lot of the flooding. So. Our folks were on, the emergency folks were on, the city folks were on, and it was just an amazing collaborative conversation. So I appreciate all of us coming in and really being prepared. Um, one, one last question that I do have is around, I know there was conversation about masks being worn and things along those lines. Is that our school staff's responsibility? Whose responsibility is that to, to make sure that folks are maintaining that? Is that what have that? Well, I mean, Willie, you're coming in and out. Can you repeat that again? 
I think he was just asking whose responsibility will it be to uh, monitor the various protocols, okay. including the masks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, through Chairman Jones, through um, Board Member Willie, um, that would ultimately be the responsibility of the American Red Cross as well as the city of Jacksonville. They will have individuals there that will be assisting with these COVID-19 guidelines that I spoke about. But as a last resort, um, my staff will be there to provide any type of assistance that's necessary. So I will have a minimum of two officers assigned to each one of the shelters. So if it gets to the point where we need to get involved, we will provide assistance, but hopefully um, I think uh, most individuals will comply. Okay. Any other questions? See, I see no other hands. Uh, Dr. Green, I guess the next item is lift jacks. Yes, sir. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Director Edwards, for your, your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Green. If we could put up, uh, here it comes. Uh, I'm gonna share a brief presentation on an organization called Lift Jacks. Um, its model is built upon the purpose-built communities. Next, if you go to the next slide. Uh, the purpose-built communities is a strategy, as it's stated here, for a holistic neighborhood revitalization. Um, its aim is to root out concentrated and generational poverty. Uh, lift, and I'm sorry, I have to forget, I have to keep telling someone to change the slide. Next slide. Um, lift Jacks is developing their model that originated in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, in a neighborhood called East Lake. Um, I've actually viewed the documentary related to East Lake. Um, as you see the baseline data before the model was introduced, uh, they only had 30% high school graduation rate, 5% uh, fifth graders meeting state math standards. As you can see, the national crime rate was 18 times higher than the national crime rate. Um, it was a very uh, sad situation. Next slide. And so this organization and um, that was Lift East Lake, that was the name of the organization at that time, concentrated on uh, three main purposes. And the first one was uh, low income housing. And with the partnership with the uh, housing authority, they came in and develop what they called mixed income housing. So it was a mix of houses, apartments, or condos, but the, as you can see, what that housing community looked like in the beginning, and then after Lift East Lake came in, the changes that were made. Next slide. Here is the part that's the most important to us as an organization. Um, that organization came in and developed a cradle to college education pipeline. And Eastlake, what they did is they brought in um, charter schools to offer the items that you are seeing here, offering literacy after school and college prep preparation programs. They expanded uh, early learning. They, they brought in their own early learning center they strengthened the education system, um, which supported uh, more than 2,000 students in that community. So that picture that you see with the students with the uniforms on is actually the, the high school located in East Lake. Next slide. They also came in and, um, as you can see, established other amenities that would support that community. Uh, they launched a first tee of East Lake program, which we have first tee in Jacksonville as well. Uh, they brought in the YMCA, uh, they opened a public grocery store, they brought in SunTrust, Wells Fargo, uh, they added other community um, 
support such as the Healthy Connection, a community garden. I also believe they brought in a wellness center that had a gym and uh, the membership was for the East Lake residents. Next slide. Part of the Lift East Lake, they, they engaged the residents who chose to stay in East Lake. This organization um, recruited residents. They wanted them to hold leadership positions. They wanted to give them uh, a, a place at the table to make decisions about what would uh, happen in East Lake. They helped set standards of expectation. Uh, so I don't want to give the, the view that it was all rosy because if you have a chance to view the documentary, you will find that um, some, some residents left, uh, other residents uh, felt resentment, but the goal of the Lift East Lake was to bring that community together to revitalize it. Part of the East Lake, the Lift East Lake, is they developed a community quarterback. That, that community quarterback was sort of the leader or the facilitator of progress. Um, next slide. Um, the, they coordinated all of the efforts across the model pillars. And, and as I stated, there are three um, model pillars that we'll see in, in the upcoming slides, but they developed this nonprofit central focus of, of organization. And again, they, did everything through Lift East Lake and even the East Lake Foundation. It just ensured that the model of implementation and partnership and coordination would stay on track and that this group was sort of the ones who would hold uh, the community and itself accountable for ensuring the success of Lift East Lake. Now, as I stated this in the beginning, this started back in the uh, late 1990s. And today, East Lake uh, has dramatically changed. Next slide. So the current state data, and um, this information, again, is all coming from the purpose-built communities, uh, indicated that their inaugural class had 100% uh, graduating on time, 100% of the inaugural class in 2017 was accepted to at least one college. You see the change in medium income. You see the change in the reduction in violent crimes. So this organization supported this defined community called Eastlake. And right now, this 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 organization called Lift Jacks is trying to model the same thing. Uh, I believe Lift Jacks actually started prior to me arriving uh, here as superintendent. And last year, uh, I say last year, we're not even out of last year. This year, um, they asked me to um, sit in on their meetings and join uh, their, their orientation and have an understanding about what Lift Jacks wanted to do uh, here in our community. And again, they wanted to build their model based on the purpose-built communities. Next slide. And so this slide was the first thing they introduced to me. They talked about the three areas, mixed income housing, the cradle to college education pipeline, and the community wellness. Uh, and as, as stated, it has to be a defined neighborhood. When I was first introduced, they talked about the possibility of bringing charter schools into this well-defined community. And at that time, I shared that um, I was not comfortable. Uh, I would not be willing to serve on this com committee if if your desire was to bring in charter schools. Um, there is a school that sits um, smack dead in the middle of the community that I felt they were leaning towards. 
at the beginning, they had three defined communities. Um, next slide. Those three defined communities were Newtown, Durkeeville, and East Jacks. And as you can see, Newtown um, was in board member Jones, Chairman Jones district. Uh, Durkeeville, for the most part, was in board member Willie, and East Jacks was in board member Willie's district. That committee chose East Jacks as the well defined community that they wanted to support using the purpose built communities model. Next slide. The East Jacks, you see a, a map of a detailed street map right in the in the heart of that well-defined community is Matthew Gilbert Middle School. And the concern I shared with them is that uh, you have a middle school, one that is steeped in tradition and the, the community of East Jacks, that I felt that the, the community would frown upon bringing in another middle school that would have an adverse effect on the enrollment of Matthew Gilbert. I also shared that the schools that are in that um, zone, all of them are at least a C or higher. Um, I, one of the things that I encountered when I would attend their meetings is that, uh, I don't know where they were getting their data, but um, the data may have been, uh, I don't know, someone could have made an error but they would show these schools as low performing and I, I would be there to correct them and say, no, that is not correct. Matthew Gilbert has been a C for the last two years. Um, the, even though R.L. Brown is a magnet, it, it doesn't mean that students uh, can't attend R.L. Brown. They just have to go through the process. Uh, they, Long Branch was slated as a D and we had to correct that. The only thing I could think of is they just had old information. But once we corrected that information and once the Lift Jacks organization started including members from this well-defined uh, community, it was very clear that they wanted us to support Matthew Gilbert to be that school in the Lift Jacks uh, community and not to uh, move forward with a charter school. Now, I can't say for certainty that Lift Jacks could change their mind and go in a different direction because this is an outside organization. It is supportive of this well-defined community. Uh, I'm I'm very proud of the work that they've done to, to date, working with the residents that live in that um, community. They, they have a number of residents that have been there for, their families have been there for decades and are working very hard to ensure that they truly are doing the, the work of lift East Jacks, not, um, implore gentrification. And we, we constantly uh, have to have that conversation. If the goal is to lift the community, you have to accept certain things about the community and you have to uh, put the resources in supporting that community to better itself. Next slide. So, uh, this slide is just to show the enrollment trends of the impacted schools. Uh, Long Branch and John Love would be the, uh, the neighborhood elementary schools for that defined community, as, as you saw Matthew Gilbert. And then based on our um, progression, Rains High School would be the feeder high school to Matthew Gilbert, although um, Andrew Jack, there you go. Andrew Jackson High School is inside that defined community. Andrew Jackson is a dedicated magnet. And 
it doesn't mean that students in that community, if they apply and they are accepted, they can attend Andrew Jackson. But the, the, com the committee was a little stunned when I shared none of these schools currently are below a C. Um, Andrew Jackson is a B rated uh, high school as well as William and Reigns is a C rated high school with a 96% graduation rate, which uh, I think the committee was stunned. Uh, the lack of knowledge or information about our schools was very evident that I had to share with them that anything that we're doing to lift this community will be uh, an asset and a plus, but that even uh, with the current situation, we as a school district are moving these schools uh, that would serve that community. So our latest meeting, it has been around, we need to get uh, our support around Long Branch Elementary, Matthew Gilbert and William M. Raines High School, as well as looking at an opportunity to build a pipeline of a small group of students that could apply and be accepted to uh, Andrew Jackson High School. Uh, right now, you will see that Long Branch over the last four or five years, its enrollment has been declining as well as John Love. And we believe it's mostly related to the fact that the two schools are separate. So as a parent, if you have multiple children, you, you have to get your children to two different elementary schools. We believe moving forward, if the board approves the consolidation of John Love and Long Branch, that enrollment will increase. Um, Long Branch, uh, based on our numbers, would increase to 302 students. Uh, Long Branch capacity is only uh, a little over 400 student stations. And, and so it, does, it won't take much to fill Long Branch Elementary School. In addition, the goal is to support um, our pre-K students. Under Ms. McSwain's leadership, she has done a phenomenal job of, of really beefing up our pre-K programs that are offered through the, the school district. And we have an opportunity to get more students engaged that live in that well-defined East Jacks area into a high quality pre-K programs. So next slide. So this is sort of the vision that Lift Jacks has for East Jacksonville. And it, it's dated out to 2030. And you actually see a picture of students that attend uh, Matthew Gilbert, that the goal is that we will develop a pre-K to college pipeline and that this community will thrive and that it, it, the goal is not to do gentrification. The goal is to lift up this community and provide high quality education, uh, good support resources inside the community, as well as addressing the community wellness. So the, I've already talked about the last slide. So the last slide just reiterates what I was stating that they wanted uh, community wellness, cradle to college education and mixed income housing. Nina, if you turn to the next slide, the last slide. And everything that they've developed falls under one of these three pillars that uh, sort of drives everything about the purpose-built community. And I just wanted to share this with the board because we, we've done a lot of groundwork to ensure that, hey, focus on the traditional public schools that are already in that defined community. And I requested to the group that, um, that we needed to involve school board um, Daryl Willie because this is his district as well as involving the principals of those schools because they're the ones on the ground. They're the ones closest to working with the children in that community. And I, I wanted to bring this because I told school board Willie that I was passing it off to him. 
and to keep this moving forward so that we can uh, help East Jacks be a very strong, thriving community. And it only supports um, what we're trying to do with those schools in, in that community. Uh, as a matter of fact, the organization uh, agreed to support the referendum. They felt that it would be not only in the best interest of the school district, but in their best interest, because uh, in looking at the master's facilities plan, uh, for, there's a re major renovation for Matthew Gilbert, as well as a moderate renovation for Long Branch. And these schools will have the opportunity to be addressed in a way that will only benefit that community and benefit our school district. And so with that, um, if anyone has any questions, uh, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, Board Member Hershey. Well, I was excited to hear that. I know that a couple of years ago at some conferences, um, school districts in Texas and Baltimore and uh, in um, other places that I can't remember right now, uh, when their school district had done projects that were getting ready to undertake, the city came behind them and did something like this. So I'm excited to see that um, it can go hand in hand. But I do have a couple of questions. Um, I think board member through the chair, um, I think board member Smith Juarez was on the board when the decision was made to, um, I'm gonna say separate or, or redefine John Love and Long Branch. Could you just give, you know, so it's happened since you've been on the board and we're having this conversation about putting it back. I would just like to understand the background on that, if if that's okay. Chairman Jones? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you wanted Smith Juarez since neither one of us was here at the time. <laughs> yeah, I just want to understand, you know, when, when the board makes a decision to do one thing yeah. and then we reverse it later, I'm not saying yeah. that we shouldn't reverse it. I just like to understand why it was done the first time. Okay. Board Member Smith, Smith Juarez, can you respond? So, sure. Um, and I, I will provide the disclaimer that this is to the best of my memory. I did not uh, go back and, and review um, for this pop quiz. So, <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, I'm pretty clear on it because it was, there was some significant discussion among the board. Um, and so we did uh, have some conversation that um, it certainly stuck in my mind. So at the time, the board was looking at what became 14 school reorganizations. Um, and so there were a number of considerations for what was happening programmatically across the city, um, for what opportunities there were in various um, neighborhoods and grade levels and that kind of thing. So it was part of sort of a comprehensive look at what the district was offering across school sites and, and where we were, uh, quite frankly, in terms of accountability. Um, with, with a number of our schools. And so some of it, um, as we have seen even since you've been on the board, uh, was driven by uh, some, some state accountability requirements and some of it was proactive um, by board members and the district who were listening to community hearing what some of the uh, needs and desires of community were. And I say that broadly about the um, 14 various reorganizations. Uh, one of the things that we noted at the time was that um, we had a number of different grade level configurations across the district. So we had K-5s, we had some new K-6s, we had um, K-8s, we had the, you know, middle school, high school models, those kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that the board asked the superintendent to look at was, um, this idea of early learning and, and concentrating early learning and early learning centers. Um, I, with John Love and Long Branch in particular, they did not share the proximate geography that some of the other schools um, that you know had this sort of early learning and and um, mid primary. Uh, 
model. So for example, you know, they weren't across the street from each other. They weren't. And so a lot of the discussion was the distance between those two schools. And, and um, if I'm correct, there, there actually is a highway that goes between the two. So the idea of walking um, with siblings or that kind of thing was something that we heard um, from the communities. There was um, a lot of discussion around um, wanting to have this early learning model, which at the time was engaging a rainforest curriculum that gave some outdoor experiential learning. There were a number of different early learning um, segments and pieces that were going to be implemented as part of this um, and the opportunity for expanded um, pre-years, I'll call them, kind of the, the pre-K three, four. Um, so the board did have a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about whether or not uh, these two physical plants were the right places for this type of model. Ultimately, we decided to, to move forward um, and to try it. Um, but I think what we have seen from the community and, and certainly would you know, also want the, the board member to weigh in, uh, uh, board member Williams in that area, um, but I think what, what we have seen in enrollments in the schools and have heard back from community is that um, the, the separation is, is just too much. And so families are either choosing a K-5 or, um, you know, as sibling groups are divided between the two schools, it just logistically it's not working for families. And so um, they're, they're finding other options that are just better configurations for them. So we haven't seen the schools thrive, which to me uh, says, you know, that we need to think about doing something differently in the community. So that's a little editorial and a little history. <laughs> Forgive me for mixing the two, um, but I hope that answers your question. I, well, I appreciate, I appreciate a, that because I think it's important for the current board to understand the work of the previous board. And sometimes we try things and they're great. And I do appreciate the editorial of this was the idea and the intent, um, but then when we hear what Dr. Green said, hers is similar to the original idea of uh, having a you know strong early learning and 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 um, going through college. So the intent and the theme or the desire has not changed; it's just different. Um, and uh, Chairman Jones, I have one question for you. Um, I do like the idea of um, of Matthew Gilbert kind of being at the center. But uh, again, can you give us a little history? Didn't when Matthew Gilbert was built, weren't there families in that area that literally gave up land for Matthew Gilbert to, to be built? I think it's important to understand some of that history as well. Uh, yes, that's my understanding that there were families that gave up land. But what, what really and I, I'm, I'm gonna take a page from uh, Smith Juarez editorialized a little bit here. What really uh, divided our neighborhoods was the expressway system. They they just decimated a lot of the older traditional neighborhoods, and with open housing occurring in the late 50s, early 60s, a lot of people who who had a vested interest in. And the key to it all, I think, and what I like most about this lift jacks is they realize you have to have a good income mix unlike newtown success zone which was tried and modeled after the harlem kids zone in new york that started right before uh we got on the board i think a uh, board member former board member constance hall and dr vd wanted to help with the uh, newtown success zone and Former Mayor Payton chose, had uh, former Mayor Glover and Pam Paul to co-chair a committee. And they looked at the east side, they looked at some of the same communities that Lift Jacks looked at. And they chose Newtown because they felt with, with the elementary school in SP Livingston, the middle school in Eugene J. Butler, that possibly could become a high school. And with the college, they could do the same thing, that cradle to college concept. Uh, what they missed in that entire process, and Mayor Payton and I have talked about it, is the fact that the Harlem Kids Zone gets $60 million from Wall Street every year, and that's why they can do what they, they've done 
where it's Jacksonville in, in the children in the uh, Newtown Success Zone has been struggling to get just a million dollars a year to try to improve uh, that neighborhood. And but the biggest missing piece, in my opinion, is the housing mix. Haberjacks has built or is building 100 homes in the Newtown Success Zone. It's a defined area because you got to have that in order to to understand your success and and the progress you're making. But the uh, David Hicks and uh, Wayne Weaver committed a million dollars to Haberjacks to build 100 new homes, but you're not increasing the income levels in that neighborhood. And I think that's the part that's caused the Newtown Success Zone not to be success that it, that it was just designed to be. But uh, yes, they did, going back to your original question, there were families that gave up land because they wanted a school in that neighborhood. And I think uh, Mr. Gilbert was a well-known, uh, Pastor Gilbert was a well-known preacher in, in Jacksonville. They named the school after him. Thank you. I just I know that was a little history lesson, but I think it's important for us to understand the pre the, the past as we make decisions moving forward. So, um, thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Board Member Willie. Board Member Willie. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I just uh, I appreciate. It. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I appreciate the conversation, and I think uh, one of the things that, uh, and I appreciate the history lesson. A lot of these, a lot of where we are today, is built off where we've come and all the different decisions that uh, that we've made. I, I think one key piece that Dr. Green mentioned, and I think that I'm going to keep mentioning, is doing this with with a high level of intentionality. Um, I think oftentimes when you think about any project like this, it has to be done with and not to the community. And one of the things that they have done is really try to bring in folks from the community. I know Rudy Jamison's on sort of that higher level committee. They have the Eastside Coalition who's working directly with them. So I think those conversations need to continue. Um, and those are the checks and balances that you need. And I think those are really important. I think the other thing to be careful of and mindful of is when you talk about mixed income, there's an easy swing that you can move into an area where you actually start to, to gentrify an area and move people out. And I think that's also this key balance that we have to strike when we think about uh, this situation. So I'm excited to sort of join even more full-fledged the, the committee and understand like where we're trying to move it. And I think, um, as other people have said too, having Matthew Gilbert as sort of the, the jewel in the center of it all, you have to have something to build around. And we have an amazing history and foundation with that school. So I think if we can focus there and figure out how to build around those pieces that we have, I think we can be in a good place, but I'm excited about any resources coming in as long as we're able to actually move those resources together and not have someone come in with demands. And I think the way that we've entered so far, I think we're having those active conversations and I hope they continue as we're able to do it. So I appreciate these conversations and what I'll commit to as, as, if, as I'm now sort of the point, I'll continue to bring information back to the board so we know sort of how we're progressing along the way. So there's no surprises when we get to anything that this full board needs to either vote on or just be aware of when it comes to that, this, this community. But um, I'm excited about it. And I think we can really move it if we're very intentional about it. All right, thank you. That's good to know. Um, I think the residents uh, will certainly hold you accountable on that one, Mr. Will, <laughs> knowing, knowing how passionate they are in that East Side neighborhood. Uh, Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you so much. I, I'm curious who, if there's any context, maybe Dr. Green knows, who brought Lift Jacks and um, what council district is this? It's, 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 well, I know it's City Council District 7, but I don't know who brought them. Um, through the chair to Vice Chair Anderson, uh, as I stated, I believe this started prior to me arriving, so I'm not sure who brought it here. Uh, the chairman of the committee is Darnell Smith. And I was invited to a meeting at the Community Foundation. So I know the Community Foundation was involved. Uh, some very high level individuals that um, are sort of the movers and shakers of the city are involved. But I do not know personally who brought it. Uh, I, I was just brought in 
when they were trying to make a decision whether they wanted to go charter or work with the Duval County Public Schools. They are also working with the organization Purpose Built Communities. Um, David Garfunkel was just recently hired as the executive director of Lift Jacks, and David has been a part of the committee from the very beginning. And advisors from uh, Purpose Built Communities come to Jacksonville to uh, provide support to the, to the group. Uh, there is also a Lift Orlando. And uh, pre-COVID, we had scheduled a trip to go see Lift Orlando, the community that, that defined community. And the school that is the main school is Evans High School. I don't know if any of you remember Evans High School used to be, um, they would compare Evans and Rebalt and Reigns to be in the same category. Evans was a former F rated high school and today their their graduation rate is you know somewhere in the high 90s almost to 100 percent they brought in uh, additional programs to evans as part of that lift orlando piece so we've moved away i don't want to say completely away but i just shared east lake because that's where it began and that purpose-built communities are modeled uh, many of them are modeled after Eastlake, but they will always tell you there are really successful uh, defined neighborhoods that use traditional schools and there are successful ones that are using charter schools. And I, I just felt it would be um, vitally important that we that we put our arms around the schools that are right there in that community that um, are so steep in tradition and that that community wants to remain uh, as, as a vital part of, of Lift Jacks. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, can, can you remind me who, who is the council representative for District 7? I apologize, I don't know that off the top of my head. Uh, that's, that's, that's Reggie Gaffney. Okay, okay Councilman Gaffney, thank you so much. Um, so I, I have done, um, this is the both all of these areas really when I'm looking at the map here. This is where I was doing in-home treatment, in-home therapy, maternal mental health, children's mental health therapy, um, with full service schools as well. And I was doing that work. Um, and so I'm I'm really excited. I I had hopes for the new town success zone. Um, I'm, I'm sad to see that that hasn't gotten quite the traction that they hoped it would have. And I and I think that this is a great opportunity for uh, the east side. Um, I know last year. I had asked the board about doing a community learning exchange with um, Rudy Jamison's group and, and being more involved in the restoration and development of these communities. And so I'm really glad that this is an opportunity where our public school system can be a jewel. Um, I am so grateful to the superintendent for being a strong leader, uh, for being an advocate there, for being somebody that the community trusts, um, for being someone that they can see reflected in their um, history and their culture and, and a willingness to believe and, and take in what you are giving them because I think that this um, there's so much potential for our public school system here and um, I'm really I'm excited to see Daryl board member Willie go um, go on and be the point person for this um, because I think that it's an unfortunate the story that has been told and, and I don't know like you said maybe where some of the misinformation came from or what the intention was from the folks that are bringing this to the area. But um, I love that the, that the public school system can be um, a great partner in this and that together we can lift communities that are in desperate need of um, rehabilitation from the inside, you know, from the inside out. And so um, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm excited to, to track the progress of it any way that we can continue to support the revitalization and development, I think, is a, is a great opportunity for us as a system. So thank you, Dr. Green, for getting involved. I wish you well. And thank you, Dr. Or Board Member Willie, for um, stepping up and keeping this going. All right. Uh, Board Member Joyce. <laughs> yes, yeah, the Chair to Dr. Green. I know that you mentioned that um, Lyft um, was part of the partnership with the Orlando School Evans, the uh, 
the community and school piece there. And um, I'm not 100% sure about the history of this, but I know that that model was put in at White a few years ago. Um, so can you talk to uh, the choice of putting, if the lift, if lift is doing the um, revitalization in this project, um, why was Ed White chosen for the, um, the community school piece there? Through the chair to uh, board member Joyce, community, that was put at Ed White prior to me arriving. But Lift Jacks is, is different. Um, it is not, it's greater than what commu um, communities in, in schools is for Ed White. So it, it is very different. Uh, even though Evans has part of that, that doesn't mean that it couldn't um, come to whichever high school would be the key high school for that defined community. Um, right now, through the state, if you have one, you don't qualify for another one until the state has fully implemented a in every district. So it'll, it'll be a while before we even qualified for that grant. Currently, we don't qualify because we have Ed White. So it is, it, it is very different because they're more concerned about the entire defined neighborhood wellness, community wellness. Whereas Ed White, their, con their main concern are about the students that are attending Ed White and their and their wellness, and yes, they do reach out to their families uh, to su to support. But this is uh, including mixed income housing, uh, the education part, and then the community wellness part. So it is a, a very different than what's happening at Ed White. Um, I I can just say I remember when the program uh, came to uh, Ed White and the vision of the program. I'm not sure that that's been completely, um, you know, seen through. Um, and, I and I have talked to some people who were concerned that maybe that program, um, because Ed White is a dedicated, or not a dedicated, but because it's a magnet school, that, that, that if that program actually fit um, with Ed White or maybe you know, if there was possibility of moving it, moving it to Reigns. That's just some conversation that I've had with um, some people that are, that are involved in that program, but it's something that um, we can talk about at a, at a later date. Yes, thank you. Uh, all right, thank you. Board Member Hershey. I just wanna say that the program at Ed White, it's my understanding that that was the work of um, the former board member and getting it there as there was a shift in dem demographics uh, and the West side was at the point where they did not have the same support services that other schools in the district had. So there was a need and a request to put something in, in on the West side uh, to begin to serve those families. Um, and so it was really at that time an innovative way uh, to get some services to the West Side for families out there that at that particular time uh, was not receiving some of the support um, like with, with team up and some after school programs uh, that other parts of the community were getting. That was the original purpose. Okay, thank you. Any other questions on comments on lift jacks? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to shelter preparation. Dr. Green. Thank you, Chairman Jones. We're going to share. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. School. It's, I'm sorry. School reopening <laughs> update. <That's, laughs> <laughs> well, it may feel like shelter, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we're going to talk about considerations for reopening schools. Uh, Nina, if you would move to the next slide. Our number one goal is intention. Our intentional focus on student learning and well-being. Uh, 
you know, as we meet, and right now we're meeting every other day as it relates to reopening school, and there are so many decisions that have to be made, it, it could be very easy to lose our actual main mission, which is teaching and learning. And uh, Dr. Krisner talked about that yesterday and that where is learning in all of this and, and dealing with the whole COVID-19. And so we thought it was very important to focus on our goal. Our goal is intentional focus on student learning and well-being, which encompass a number of things. It, we have to assess the learning loss that may have occurred from spring break until we open uh, for next school year. Attend to social and emotional needs. You know, even though students are checking in and we have staff members checking in, we really still do not know what impact will this whole COVID-19 have on the social and emotional needs of students. We have to address the learning gaps, if any exist. Spiral back to missed content. Infuse the new standards, the best standards, uh, as I've shared in another workshop, that is still uh, moving forward. And then accelerate learning. Uh, our whole goal is how do we do all of this and ensure that students and staff and then teachers and administrators that everyone is able to do it in a safe learning environment. So that is our goal. So we have a number of objectives that we have to accomplish to meet our goal. Next slide. We have four objectives, a comprehensive planning, incorporating research-based practices, alignment with leaders and decision makers, collecting feedback and analysis of impact and promote a multifaceted communication plan. Uh, this comprehensive planning really um, is unique in that uh, we, don't, we don't have any um, former plan to, to lean on. We don't have anything that, hey, if we go to this template, this will help give us a start. This is actually well, I don't want to say grassroots, but it's starting from the bottom and working up to develop a comprehensive plan to address the operational and instructional considerations necessary to reopen schools. Uh, we have uh, gained a whole new respect for the Department of Health. I, I don't know that I've engaged as much with the Department of Health as I have done in the past few months. Uh, I don't know that I've read as much from the CDC as much as I have done in the past few months, working through whether we are doing do ball homeroom or trying to prepare to reopen schools. Uh, we are collecting feedback. As you know, we have uh, our survey out and to date we've had over 40,000 uh, responses to our surveys. And um, just as a reminder, those responses are coming from parents, students, teachers and uh, other stakeholders. And four, we have to promote a, a strong communication plan. Uh, as I shared in the last PowerPoint, I was amazed at the information that people did not know about our schools. And I don't know whether it is they chose not to want to be informed or was it we did not communicate that well enough. In this instance, communication will be key. It is communication, communication, communication. And so if we meet our objectives, we should in turn be able to meet our goal, which is uh, an intentional focus on teaching and learning. Next slide. This slide shows a number of tentacles that we must address under reopening considerations. Uh, as you can see, the implementing of the CDC recommendations, transportation, facilities, school activities, food service, staffing, mental and emotional well being, instructional programming, communications. Uh, I, I would say that this is a strong uh, list of, of areas for consideration, but each time that we delve into one of those topics, we find that we have to have subtopics or other pieces that um, come from 
uh, working with that particular topic. And, and I think you'll see some of that as I move through the presentation. When we look at the, comp the composition of the reopening process, uh, we, we put it in uh, sort of a phased approach, formation, validation, implementation. And as you see there, there's sort of a calendar of timeline and, and you, you see this red line, it has dashes and then it, it gets a, into a solid red line. Um, the areas of dashes, that's a lot of that is the planning and um, what I like to call semi-concrete because every day we seem to get new information. Uh, if you heard over the weekend, the governor now is approving summer camps that it popped up Saturday. And so we have to be nimble enough that when we get information like that, how do we pivot? How do we prepare ourselves that, oh, they want summer camps to uh, be available? And how do, we, how do we plan for those summer camps and how do we do it safely? So part of this entire process is organizing work groups. We have a number of work groups that are working on, on different pieces of, of the tentacles that I just shared. So we have an athletics work group. That work group is focused on the impact of COVID-19 on athletics. To date, we have not received any information from the Florida High School Athletic Association on are we having football season? And if we are having football season, is the timeline still intact? Uh, football is the first major sport for high school and conditioning starts in the month of June. Uh, and workouts, and when I say workouts, that means that they, their semi with pads starts in July and then the season starts in August. That is not something that you you can't wait. We're already in the last week of May and we have no information about the month of June. And without that information, then we have to function as if we are moving forward as normal. But how do you move forward in new normal? And how do we ensure that if we are going to do summer workouts, which would start uh, in June, how are we doing that safely? How are we uh, managing the whole process related to the CDC guidelines as it talks about the size that you should have in any one defined space. And now we're getting information that being outside is a good thing. So we have to be able to pivot. And that's why in the months of April, May, and June, um, we can't say for um, definite, we'll do this because we continue to get new information and we continue to show um, the Department of Education, uh, if we don't get information, it impacts something very important. And one of those very important items is transportation. And based on the information we have now, uh, if you watch the, the video that I sent you uh, with the PowerPoint, you saw that only nine students on a 77 passenger bus could be transported. And uh, Mr. Sorez is gonna talk more about that when we get to this slide. But this is our sort of uh, project management uh, in entering slide that helps us figure out, okay, where are we? Are we staying on track? And right now we're, we're kind of in the conceptualizing phase where we are developing scenarios through these subcommittees. We're developing options that uh, we can then decide, is that option even one that could be conceived in our school district? And again, we use uh, information that's based on in research or information from our local health department, uh, information from the CDC to really help us guide uh, the conversation and help us sort of look at these scenarios through how will this measure up to these guidelines. Um, through the validation phase, which is most of June and, uh, and a portion of July, uh, we will gradually 
phase in a plan design, design through summer activities and athletics. So we feel like we have to take some baby steps. We feel like we, we should put in place some summer camps in the month of July. Uh, we feel like we need to look at what the summer workout workouts um, look like for our high school students. Uh, so that subcommittee is um, developing a plan that uh, we would take those baby steps as early as June 15th. And again, the number one goal has to be uh, how do we align up with the guidelines and can we ensure that um, students can actually do the activities that they need to do, but do it in a safe and effective manner. Um, schools and departments, uh, we are taking trips out to schools and looking at models that would fit different school configurations. All schools were, are not built the same. Uh, we know that we have real concern for our older schools it is uh, a lot of it has to do with the air circulation and and how do we ensure that those schools can open in a safe and effective manner when we know that th those children are also the children we need to see the most and we we are working through that process all the way to scaling which starts in august um, where where as i've said if the governor does not come out and delay school opening. We do not foresee the changing in the date of school opening. And right now that's August 10th. What I tell people is it's not about whether we're opening. It is what will it look like when we open? Will it be um, everyone coming back to school? Will it be that we have um, a hybrid of some students in school other students on, on uh, Duval homegrown, or will it be um, that the governor has stated we're not opening schools until after Labor Day? The governor could say everyone's on home education until after Labor Day, which means school does start August 10th, but it will it will start through Duval homegrown. As as I keep talking, I, I'm probably talking more issues. Uh, related to how we develop this comprehensive plan. Next slide. As I stated, we, we work very closely with the uh, Florida Department of Health, Duval, uh, and gaining all the information from the CDC. Um, last week, the CDC sent out new guidelines for opening schools, which I, I will show you uh, in a couple of slides. But we utilize these resources um, and we try to take in consideration the best practices from not only these organizations, but I sit on the FADS committee, uh, the medical FADS committee, and listening to other districts, listening to pediatricians uh, uh, of, of their advice, what would be best practices about reopening schools. Uh, the, the district will continue to promote and encourage healthy behaviors that reduce the spread of COVID-19. As you know, um, district employees, we are taking baby steps coming back to uh, work in the building starting June 8. We will uh, come back with one day a week and, and three days working from uh, home. And as we continue, we understand that we need to provide training so that we're continuing to encourage employees to utilize those healthy behaviors so that we can reduce the spread of COVID-19. Next slide. This was in, <clears throat> this slide was in a PowerPoint that we had at the board meeting. Um, we continue to look at this information each day. Uh, this is data uh, as you see, it was pulled on May 26 at 1028. It updates twice a day, usually one time in the morning and one time in the evening. Uh, this information continues to tell us by age distribution of cases. It has demographic information. It shows us um, how, what the data is doing over time, but we do continue to utilize this information to uh, help support this comprehensive plan. Next slide. 
as I stated, the CDC uh, a week ago put out new guidelines for schools reopening. What you see on this slide is um, sort of their summary page. The link down at the bottom, if you click that link, it will take you to a more detailed uh, implementation of the summary page. I believe that detailed uh, uh, guidelines are somewhere between 14 to 18 pages that they've now reduced down to a one pager uh, for school districts to review to make decisions about, do you meet enough safeguards to say you're going to open schools? Um, things that you should consider. Uh, I'm not gonna go through every uh, checkpoint because I know you have this PowerPoint, uh, but the first one, will reopening be consistent with applicable state and local orders? Again, if the governor comes out and says, well, we will not have face-to-face -face instruction until after Labor Day, uh, we're not gonna open our schools. So that's the first checkpoint. Are we in alignment with state and local orders? Uh, is the school ready to protect children and employees at higher risk for severe illnesses? Um, that is one of the areas where you click and it gives you more information that we would need to review. Are we providing uh, enough safeguards for those, um, it says employees, but um, I'm sorry, children and employees, it may mean that we would have to do something different for our students who are at a higher risk for medical issues that they are dealing with. It may mean that we have to look at something different, uh, employees coming back to this building that may be at a higher risk. How do we um, provide that protection? Are you able to screen students and employees upon arrival for symptoms and history of exposure? Uh, just as Director Edwards said that there would be a questionnaire, three questions, uh, those same three questions uh, are what they would be recommending that we should do as a school district to ask the three questions and then check the temperatures of employees and children before they enter into the building. Um, again, if you, if any of those are no, it's recommending do not open. As you can see, it's an all or nothing. If all yes, um, you can move forward. If any knows, you need to meet the safeguard first before moving forward. And as you can see, there are a number of recommendations that they are talking about opening and then recommendations that you need to continue on monitoring once you have opened. Next slide. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Soares, and he's going to talk about the uh, key levers for transportation. Before he comes on, the key levers, these are, we identify key levers that something has to possibly change before we could move forward with, uh, with an, a, a concrete plan. And transportation is probably the number one key lever uh, that we're facing at this time. That, that is correct, Dr. Green. Um, the current guidelines, they still try to maintain the six foot social distancing. And that forces us to have one student per seat every other row. And you can kind of see on the graphic to the left how you have like the, the orange seat and then you go diagonally over to the next row, another one, another one. And that kind of spacing would limit us to only about nine to 11 students on a bus. Our normal capacity is 65 to 77 students. So the nine to 11 student limit is about 15% of the capacity. And to give you a frame of reference, you know, we run school buses in three waves, the elementary, a high school wave, then an elementary wave, and then a middle school wave. And in those three waves, the elementary layer is about 13,800 riders. That's the smallest. The middle school is around 15,000, high school is around 17,000. Complying with these guidelines would limit the capacity of a wave down to 6,000 students. So you couldn't even support the smallest elementary wave. Uh, if we relax these standards to a spacing where we had one student uh, in each uh, set of seats, so instead of skipping rows, you'd have two students per row, 
that would bring us up to around 22 to 26 students. Uh, but even that larger capacity uh, would only enable us to meet the elementary wave. We couldn't meet the to middle or high school wave. So we really, as Dr. Green mentioned, we're really limited in transportation and we're working those numbers you know, now to try to uh, see what's gonna happen. ESC, uh, the ESC buses have a smaller capacity. Typically you have a, uh, either wheelchair bound students, ambulatory or a mix of the two. And depending on the mix, you can hold up to 15 to 30 students normally. And we would drop down to five to seven students on the ESC. So that's also uh, an issue uh, on the ESC bus routes as well. Uh, we don't have the buses to accommodate. Like if the answer was to try to get more buses just to increase, increase our bus capacity. You really can't get them. The deadline to order new buses was back in February, and uh, you, you simply can't get uh, Florida spec compliant buses in 60 days. In addition, the cost would be pretty pretty significant to do that. Um, another thing that we you could do to help accommodate is uh, is vary the arrival times. But if we if we extended the arrival time so that you can make a mul multiple trips to a school instead of everyone arriving at eight o'clock at the elementary school, some may have to arrive at seven o'clock. That's possible, but then you're talking about multiple trips where you used to have one trip. The current transportation budget is $65 million when you count fuel. If you increase that budget by 10 or 20%, you're talking six to $12 million annual cost increases, which could be caught, which really cost prohibitive. So even though you could potentially stagger arrival times, the cost would be pretty, pretty high. And, and again, any of those changes would come with the increased costs in personnel, operational services. We're already factoring in cleaning and disinfecting to, uh, the, the bus providers are uh, to, to make that part of our standard operating procedure. So again, the, again, these are the current CDC guidelines and that's what I was briefing to you and I'm just trying to interject, you know, the inability to, to meet them at this point. We hope there's gonna be some further relaxing as we go by. And that's really all I have, thank you. Next slide. The next very important key lever is facilities. Um, the, under the current CDC guidelines, um, we would need to intensify cleaning and disinfecting frequently touched areas. Um, we are reviewing a number of areas that uh, could support this in a stronger manner, such as uh, currently, we only have one or two custodians working while students are at school, and then the, the bulk of the custodians work in the evening. Uh, we should consider, do we want more custodians working during daytime while students are in the school so that we can continue to uh, disinfect those frequently high touch areas? Um, you know, if, you're, if you have one custodian, it, the restroom would be where they would probably spend the bulk of their time um, because it's a very high frequent, it's highly frequently visited and it has a lot of high touch areas. Um, we want to, again, look at promoting social distancing through the possibility of physical barriers, partitions, um, workspace layouts uh, to ensure that individuals remain six feet apart whenever possible. Uh, that's why in this building, we've talked about coming one, one day a week because we know we can space them out uh, pretty well that they are six more, you know, they're more than six feet apart. Uh, we, we need to consider, would we close communal spaces such as break rooms and conference rooms or you know, areas like the media center uh, that we would send books to the classroom instead of opening up the media center because again, it, it has a lot of high touch areas. Um, we need to consider the, the possibility of restricting non-essential visitors, volunteers and activities invol involving external groups and organizations. So we have more than just the concern of when we um, come back to school is how are we going to continue to uh, have a strong disinfecting uh, process in place? How are we going to ensure that everyone, again, we can address the social distancing and continue to keep going back to our goal, providing a high quality education and moving through that process. 
The second part of school facilities, a key lever, is the arrangement of classrooms. There are some things that we, we, we can't forget. You'll see the red triangle. Remember last year we had the requirement to uh, mark off uh, hard corners where students were to go if they had an active shooter. If you look at the top graphic with the two kidney tables and I think there are like 20 desks that's representing uh, an early pre-K to three classroom, you'll notice that those desks are pretty close together and you have bookcases, the teacher's desks and small group kidney tables. Um, based on the guidelines for the CDC, probably the maximum we could put in a classroom and that's removing the anything extra such as a bookcase or small group tables. The most we probably could fit meeting uh, the social distancing guideline would be 12 desks. Again, if you go to that link that shows it's a new story, that new story is actually about Call Your County. You will, uh, they, she actually shows a classroom uh, with pretty much everything removed and 12 desks in, in that classroom. Uh, again, we have to consider communal use of spaces such as dining halls, uh, playgrounds with the new information about being outside being a good thing. We feel confident we want physical education, but again, it's going back and how do you continue to disinfect those touch areas on playgrounds? Um, we have to consider again, non-restricting non-essential visitors. Uh, currently daycares are open and daycares do not allow anyone once their school or the daycare has opened to receive children. Uh, once they have received them, the only time anyone can enter into the daycare is if a parent is there to pick up their child. And I believe they even have a system where they cannot go back to the classroom, that they have a process by uh, which they bring the child to the parent. Uh, we need to look at pre-designated entry and exit paths. Um, marking floor and walls appropriately. Uh, when, when you come back to the district office, when you come into the front door, you'll, you'll see that we have the markings on the floor for social distancing being six feet apart. Um, you'll see that the front desk has uh, a plexiglass so that um, that person sitting behind that desk uh, is, is able to talk to whoever's coming into the building but at the same time has a layer of protection. Um, we may have to consider, consider reducing the use of lockers and determining where materials will be stored, uh, looking at staggered arrival and drop-off times. But as you heard, Mr. Soares, that will incur additional costs. Um, again, these are levers that we have to gain more information to make a concrete determination of what will our plan be. Uh, cafeteria, a, a huge concern. Uh, group dining is how we typically feed our children, breakfast, lunch. Uh, I know that some of our elementary schools does breakfast in the classroom, but if you cannot put in our, in a typical cafeteria, we may be able to serve anywhere from 350 to 450 students. Um, using the social distancing guidelines, that is reduced by almost 75%. That it would be, it would be only about 100 to 140 students that we could actually serve in the cafeteria. Um, we, every school and every location will have to identify an area to separate anyone who exhibits COVID-like symptoms during hours of operation and ensure that children are not left without adult supervision. Uh, in key levers for some of our schools, they are already at capacity. Where do we find that space? Um, are we going to um, re-identify re a space that was once used for something else and change it to um, this separation location. So every school will have to work through this process of 
figuring out what are those key levers and what are the, the roadblocks we have to overcome. Next slide. Key levers, school activities. Um, gradual, we're, we're, we're trying to gradually introduce outdoor activities, sports, and other recreational uh, activities while ensuring the safeguards to mitigate the spread of infection. Um, again, we're, we're considering opening up summer camps in the month of July. Uh, we'll have to look at the limit group size and mobility. Uh, we'll, one of the things that they recommend is uh, ensuring that student and staff groupings are static, meaning if this is a group 10 students together, that they stay with that 10 group. They don't go with another group. They don't branch off and go somewhere else that the adult who's working with those children stay with them uh, as much as possible. Uh, they are also recommending limiting gatherings, events, extracurricular activities. Um, again, if you can't maintain social distancing, they, they highly recommend that you limit the size. Uh, so for some of our summer camps, uh, we, we are looking at, um, uh, I said summer camp, for athletics, we're looking at a, a staggered workout. So maybe only 10 students at a time can work out for X amount of time, and then another 10 can come for X amount of time. So we're looking at ways that we can try our best to keep moving forward, but at the same time implementing the behaviors that would reduce the spread of COVID-19. Next slide. Food service, that, that kind of falls very similar into the category of cafeteria use. Uh, we may have to utilize, again, our grab-and-go boxes or grab-and-go bag lunch, uh, depending on whether some students will eat in a cafeteria and some students eat somewhere else. Uh, what we feel is that our food is going to have to be able to be mobile. Uh, it, it's not going to be as we've done in the past where students come in, pick up their tray and go to their seat. We will have to be more intentional uh, how we will implement this process of, of ensuring that we're maintaining a safe serving, feeding and cleanup for meal operation. Uh, Mr. Soares wasn't scheduled to talk about this slide, but Mr. Soares, if you have anything you want to add to this, um, I would like for you to chime in at this time. Well, we are basically the developing the actual details to implement this plan, you know, down to how we're going to shield areas, how we're going to uh, structure the menus, how we're going to serve at the different types of schools, whether they're, they're free schools or they're partial paid and all those details are, are, are exactly what we're working on right now, uh, exactly as described by uh, Dr. Green. Nothing really more to add to that. The next key lever, staffing. Nina, if you'd turn the slide. Uh, supporting our employees' physical and emotional well-being is essential, um, just like it is for our students. Uh, Currently, we're not experiencing um, a potential personnel shortfall, but uh, as time goes on through the summer, we'll have to evaluate our resignations, retirements, uh, leave and care for family members. But we part of this process is developing a training so that all employees will receive uh, training prior to starting back to work, or I won't say prior or when they come back to work, it'll be a part of one of the first things that has to happen. And that training is all about the safety uh, and the safety behaviors that employees and students need to incorporate in their daily routine. Um, establish procedures for daily health screenings. Um, as stated before, the Department of Health has created the three questions. And it, it, it also encourages, and I shouldn't say encourages, but it also says take daily temperature. That is the health screening. Uh, consider schedule adjustments, uh, staggering shifts to limit the number of employees in the work site. That's what we're doing at the main uh, school board office. We're basically staggering their work shift by days to ensure that 
um, we can keep that proximity measure in place, allowing for social distancing. Uh, the board review board policy to ensure flexibility with sick leave policies for high risk employees and that those are employees that are age 65 or old, older or those with underlying medical conditions and those needing care for others. Um, that has the potential to have a major impact on us as a district. I don't know if you read the article out of USA Today it stated that one in five teachers indicated that they are thinking about not coming back to work in the upcoming school year. If you think about a teaching force that is a little over 7,800, that would have a major impact on our ability to uh, really have a strong teaching force in place for face-to-face -face instruction. Uh, we will still limit all non-essential travel and provide facial coverings for all our employees as recommended by the current CDC guidelines. Next slide. Another key lever that many of the key levers, I may have mentioned some piece of that throughout this presentation because we believe many of them are all interconnected. But the mental and social well-being considerations, um, we, we know that we have our EAP system for our employees. We have our full service schools, school counseling. Uh, we are working on a plan, and I'd love to give a shout out to Ms. Rimfro and Katrina Taylor and the team. They are working on plans to move this forward and I'm doing a really bad job because this was supposed to be Dr. Krisner's slide and I'm kicking her thunder. So I'll allow Dr. Krisner to cover this slide. Good morning. Good um, morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. We know that by the time that we get back to school, students will have been home for about five months and we know that they need support. Um, we know that their families need support. We've seen it in the YouTube videos and we've seen it in the things that they've sent to their teachers. Um, our physical education, health education and behavioral supports team has been planning for reopening for about a month now. Um, and they, in, in addition to the support that they've been offering throughout all of this through Wellness Wednesdays and full service schools, when we get back, I know that they are planning to um, implement a survey for both employees and for students. Um, They're implementing lessons in self-care and recognizing signs of problems and how to get help. Um, we know that we are going to have students and employees with secondary trauma when they return because they are worried about the people that they care for, whether that's a spouse or a parent, um, but we need to be prepared for those to help those individuals. I know that they're planning for social and emotional learning strategies to be embedded in the curriculum guides through our, our lessons. Um, Full Service Schools has been up and running and um, they've been gearing up for the new year. We've had to date over 5,300 referrals for mental health um, through Full Service Schools, but in the last month, so for example, in February, we had nearly 600 referrals. In March, we had 220. In April, we had about 100. And in May, we've had 63. So we see those referrals, um, we see them going down um, because mainly the people who make those referrals are our teachers. Uh, the other thing that we're, we've noticed is that a number of our full service schools um, sessions that have been planned have had to be canceled because of confidentiality concerns. It's hard to, um, it's hard to share issues with the mental health counselor online when perhaps there's a parent right in the room. So they, they have been um, gearing up for the new year, understanding that there may be an increase in demand once they get back. And then once again, the employee assistance program is available for, for all of our employees. And then last but not least, we are planning for the gradual transition back to work for our 12 month employees beginning on June 8th for those people who have been working uh, primarily at home. And so um, it, it's been a process and it's one that we're certainly cons considering, planning for, and, and definitely concerned about. Thank you, Dr. Krisner. 
the next key lever is the instructional programming considerations. Uh, again, this, this is very fluid because as we get new information, then we try to take that information and see how it validates against the scenarios that um, many of the subgroups have developed. Uh, but it seems to fall into three categories. Traditional instruction, that means we're back to norm, we're back into our schools and instruction for the most part is face-to-face. Full-time virtual and full-time virtual, many parents have fallen in love with Duval Homeroom and I have to explain to them that that's not a virtual school. One, it, it's not, it hasn't even, the state actually qualifies what can be a full-time virtual school. So I constantly remind them that Duval Virtual Instructional Academy is our full-time virtual school. So parents and, and students, they can register to DVIA and this option uh, is available. And we are finding that um, parents are concerned because they may want to start off in a virtual um, platform and and then be able to come back to a tradition traditional instruction and so that's another uh, decision point that we have to build into our plan and then the third is a hybrid instruction a hybrid model students would report to school at certain intervals and students uh, are provided lessons and participate in distant learning through Duval Homeroom during times that they're not at school sites. The schedule will vary. It will be very different for elementary versus secondary. We, we know that we have to keep in mind that many of our parents are working parents and it would be quite challenging if three days a week, if you're a working parent, your elementary child is supposed to be home receiving instruction virtually. Um, we know that that may not be as problematic for secondary students. Uh, so in looking at a hybrid model, we, we keep a, a list of considerations that we have to keep in mind. Um, other considerations could include a staggered re-entry of students by grade level to reduce the number of students on campus. Um, this is more about allowing teachers the opportunity to uh, engage in more of the mental health aspect and allowing us to engage in assessing where students are or do we have a um, learning gap. It gives us an opportunity to have more, more time to spend on really more social emotional uh, topics and, and concerns than providing what we would consider uh, the core content instruction. And it will allow us to also spend time assessing those students um, to find out if there were learning gaps that occurred over uh, this time we've been during home instruction and through the summer. So our last slide, and, key, and it's not our key lever, but it's the last key lever on this presentation is communications. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Pierce to uh, talk about communications. Thank you, Dr. Green. Uh, through the chair to the board, uh, you've heard a lot about phases today and communication is no different. Um, we're implementing a phase process to what we do to make sure that our community and all of our shareholders, stakeholders are on board with what we're doing when school opens in the fall. Uh, we are currently in phase one, uh, the research input and dialogue phase. This is certainly part of it, as well as the survey that we're doing with, um, with parents and employees and other shareholders right now. Um, that will quickly move uh, into phase two. And, and what we're using throughout the summer and into next year will be pretty much our normal crisis communication protocol modified a little bit to fit the very long-term nature of the COVID-19 um, experience. Uh, Y'all probably, saw this protocol in, in action when we launched the COVID-19 webpage uh, back in March when this all first started to happen. Uh, centralized repository for information 
constant scheduled updates for when that information comes into play. And it's really organized into three big chunks of, in, of, chunks of uh, communication material. Uh, first is all about context. Uh, what's happened is sort of this, is the headline, uh, what's happening. And it's within that section of the website, we provide the context about what's driving, what we're doing, uh, what the considerations are, what all the context is. And I want to add that as we lead up to deployment, we're going to be doing a lot of work around framing that context a little bit. Uh, you all saw the story from the Collier District, uh, very demonstrably showing the school bus in the classroom. We're doing some of that work too. I think Dr. Green's been on every media outlet uh, uh, in the last five or six days, beginning to set some of the expectations and some of the framework around this. We'll do be, be doing more of that type of work as we move forward. Uh, and then we'll build out that crisis communication protocol, that website, uh, the other critical elements of that website, first the context, and then what we're doing about it. And that's where we'll uh, publish the, the decisions that we've made uh, and the directions that we're, we'll be following. And then finally, the third part of that website is what do you need to do? And that's usually subdivided in the shared stakeholder groups, uh, certainly parents and families and students, as well as employees and potentially other members of the community as well. The idea there is that no matter what media channel uh, you're a part of, um, you can go to that one website and grab the correct, most up-to-date information that we have and disseminate it appropriately. So we point media to that website. Uh, we point social media channel, channels and bloggers to that website. My own team uses the website. So once we've made an update to it that's been verified by the superintendent or relevant staff, my social media person is alerted. She goes to the website. Um, media people go to the website, et cetera. So that's very, very critical to uh, dealing with potentials for misinformation uh, and, and issues like that. So all of that will be built, all that context will be built in phase two. Uh, and then phase three, we move into the deployment uh, phase. And I think the first critical step in that deployment phase is making sure that our team, Team Duval School leadership, uh, particularly is on board with understanding all of the decisions we're making, all of the uh, issues. And so that's uh, step one will be to have uh, broad internal meetings with school leadership. And the reason for that is for every question that we get on Facebook, for every question that might get called into my office or somewhere else at the central district, there'll be 10 or 15 of those questions at the school level. Um, very informal, uh, maybe emails, maybe uh, phone calls to the schools. So we wanna make sure that our school staff is, is really super prepared uh, and can also point back to the website for up-to-date information. Uh, we'll also follow that internal dialogue uh, with some kind of leadership uh, level engagement event with the community that involves the opportunity for the community to give feedback. Um, that'll probably look like a live stream with Dr. Green and probably Paul Soares and others that are uh, instrumental in, um, into the final decisions and what we're doing. Uh, again, the opportunity to share some context to give that opportunity to the shareholders and the stakeholders for feedback and interaction. Uh, and then following that, we'll launch the platform, the website, uh, with a full slate of communication efforts across all of our channels, um, uh, emails to employees, to key communicators, uh, to uh, other leadership groups like PTA, et cetera, as well as media and social media for sure. Uh, that will kind of launch it. Again, pointing people back to the website as the true and accurate place uh, for uh, information. And then post-deployment uh, is the ongoing effort. Uh, we'll link all of our schools uh, to the website. So parents that go to their school websites primarily will see the easy link back to the up-to-date information. Uh, we want to uh, schedule and, and announce what our schedule is going to be for updates so people understand when to expect new or different information. Uh, probably in the summer months leading up to the first day of school, those updates will probably be weekly. Uh, 
and then as we get closer to the first day of school, those updates could potentially become daily as it was back in March. Um, we want to create that opportunity for two-way communication, so the website will have a feedback feature using our Talk with Team Duval um, structure, so people can send questions, comments back to us, uh, and then uh, we'll be um, implementing that system for feedback and response, uh, and then responding to those questions that come in that maybe that we didn't anticipate, using that feedback to drive future communication going forward. Um, the core message in all of this, the key message is that we're making decisions to give students the best educational experience possible under conditions that support the safety of all stakeholders. Uh, so as we talk about this in the public, that's how we want to frame it. Uh, we obviously want, as you've seen in the first uh, 15, 16, 17 slides, this is all about providing the best educational experience possible for students but doing so in a way that maintains the health and safety for all. So uh, the other message is that uh, parents need to know we have options. Uh, Dr. Green continues to reference uh, Duval Virtual Instruction Academy. Um, tr great option that many, many parents aren't yet aware of uh, if, if families uh, are concerned about coming back to school at all, we want to hold on to and serve those families. So, and then finally, as I've said, the commitment to two-way communication. So that's kind of the, four phase um, approach to what we're doing. Again, modified crisis communication model, very uh, key message in terms of serving students and maintaining health and safety. Uh, and uh, hopefully that uh, our shareholders will fully understand uh, how we plan to open in 2020. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. We have the last slide. Um, is the response plan. Uh, even if everything goes perfect and we open up and we are starting face to face, uh, we need to also have a plan. What happens if uh, a confirmed person with COVID-19 is in the building? And following, again, the CDC guidelines and our Department of Health uh, guidelines, there is a school decision tree. And going through that school decision tree will determine, uh, should we just close down a classroom? And those students that are in that classroom would be on Duval homeroom for a certain period of time, or would it be that we're just closing one school for a short um, period, two to five days to allow uh, the, the, the entire building to be clean, disinfected, and um, figure out through, con and it says contact tracing. We do not do contact tracing, but that it would be done through the local health officials. They tell us when, when we have a confirmed COVID-19 case, they would ask us, was this person in your building? And we would say, no, this person was the last date that they were in our one of our buildings was such and such date. It's outside that date. Therefore, um, they we would not need to notify anyone because the person did not come in contact. This is no different than uh, when we have other outbreaks, such as MRSA. If a student had MRSA at a school, the health department would call us and we would have to figure out who are all the people at that, that, at that school that the student came in contact, and we would follow our normal procedure of notifying uh, the individuals that could possibly be uh, affected by that person. But we have a strong plan with Duval Homeroom that we can turn on a dime. So if we had to close one school, we can easily turn on a dime and go to Duval Homeroom for that one particular school. Uh, or if we had to uh, close the entire school district again, we would be able to turn on a dime and utilize Duval Homeroom. But it's very important that we have a decision tree and that that decision tree is known by our community. So that if there is a positive case or a confirmed case in a school, uh, 
parents can see, well, that's the decision tree. That's why they had to close the school or that's why just my child's classroom uh, can't come to school for a certain number of days or um, the district has to close down the entire school, all schools in the district. Uh, it, it really will give people information that decisions aren't just being made out of the clear blue that we are actually following a flow chart that or a decision tree that tells us if this happens, then do this. Um, we think that that is very important to show the complete picture of this comprehensive plan, all the things that are taken into consideration to open our schools and all the things that would need to be in consideration if a decision was to close a school. Again, you, there's a link to the website that really uh, takes the decision tree uh, into more detail and more information if you uh, want to uh, read more about the school decision tree. Uh, that is the end of our PowerPoint. And so now um, I'd be more than happy to open it up for questions, Chairman Jones. All right, thank you, Dr. Green. That's a very thorough uh, contingency plan, I think, that prepares us for, and to be flexible because we don't know what the CDC is going to require for a school reopening. I hope we can get back to face-to-face -face instruction at the beginning of the school year, but we just don't know at this point. Uh, questions? Uh, Board Member Joyce. Thank you, um, Chair Jones. <clears throat> um, I have a so much. Thank you, Dr. Green, for the presentation to start with. There is so much information here. It's um, quite a lot to digest. I am not actually sure if I can ask all the questions, appropriate questions right now, but I am looking forward to the dialogue. Um, we get a lot of feedback. I don't know where it is. Is that from my microphone? I don't know. Okay, go ahead. It's, hopefully it's ended. Um, I want to start with the CDC guidelines. So they're giving guidelines um, is, and I, I'm assuming these guidelines are nationwide guidelines. Through the chair to uh, board member Joyce, yes. Okay. And do we know if the guidelines, have there been, has there been um, conversation specifically to school guidelines with educators and people in our education community. Through the chair to board member Joyce, are you asking me, did the CDC include educators? Uh, you probably I, don't know, but I just, I, I, maybe you do. I, I can't answer for certainty. Uh, we've given input and our, our number one concern starts with transportation. And we've given input that we could not afford to run transportation um, based on the guidelines that we're receiving. So, but I can't tell you whether educators are, are on their panel to, when they develop these guidelines. And um, when it says the CDC recommends these, these schools have these several safeguards in place, does that mean that the school district has to comply with these recommendations? Well, through the chair to board member Joyce, it, it, it is what it states, recommendations. We have to comply with what our state and local requirements. So right now, the Department of Education has not given us uh, any specific guidelines but it, I'm under the impression that they're going to expect us to submit our plan. And they may have 
criteria to say we accept your plan or we don't accept your plan. That hasn't been put in writing, but that is what I believe will happen just based on information we received to this point. Okay, so these are the CDC recommendations. We are in the process of working with the Florida Department of Education, presenting a plan uh, for the state of Florida. So that meaning that um, we might not have to adhere to all of these restrictions. Is that correct? What it means to the chair, to board member Joyce, is that we are going to rely on a lot on our local health department um, and rely on the research and information that we are receiving from the CDC guidelines. Um, I believe as, as a leadership team and superintendent, we're gonna base our plan on best practices and, and what we feel we, can actually do, as well as ensuring that we work with the, the or stakeholders that will be most imp impacted. And for that, that's also our employees. So we have unions that we have to work with, and they would have to be a part of ensuring that they've given uh, appropriate input into this plan, as well as making sure that we are building a plan that the school district is protected. I've never stated every time anyone's asked me a question, our plan is to try to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. I don't believe we can develop a plan that would eliminate it. Our goal is to simply put in the uh, safety precautions that would mitigate as much as possible the spread of COVID-19 amongst our, our, our students and our employees. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, the other question that I have is, as you in the district work with the Department of Education, are there any hard deadlines as to plans being submitted? When are we going to have some clarification before school starts as to what the recommendation from the Department of Education is going to be for the schools in our county, in our, in our state? Uh, through the chair to board member Joyce, currently we do not have any guidelines. Currently we have not received any timeline that you must have this done by this date. Uh, as you know, currently, we don't have a signed budget. So we have this unique situation in that we are developing plans, uh, but we don't have a signed budget because whatever we're doing, it will incur costs and we have to be prepared. Can we afford that cost? So right now we, are looking at all the key levers. And in my presentation, all of these things have to be under consideration. And that's why when you saw the dotted red line and then it started to get solid, we believe it could be in mid July before we have true direction uh, from the Department of Education. Uh, and as I stated, it is my belief they have not put anything in writing that we have to submit a plan, but it is my belief that we will have to submit a plan. We had to submit a plan for home instruction. So that's why I believe we'll have to submit a plan for reopening. Okay, um, thank you for that. Um, you know, when I look at the slide specifically for when can we reopen, and you have to meet all of the criteria to move on to the next phase. What can, there's so many things that concern me about really the practicality of any of this. Uh, social distancing students at school, putting nine children on a bus, um, just there's so many things about the, the recommendation from the CDC that I 
think that it's actually impossible to implement in our school system. Um, but one of the things is employees wearing a face cloth covering as feasible. And so um, there is a lot of um, controversy in the city right now about face masks and whether you should wear them or not. I think it's in the state, um, you know, but is this, does this mean based on this recommendation that employees will have to wear face coverings when school starts back if they're going to teach in a classroom? What this means to the chair, to board member Joyce, is that we need to be prepared if that is the case. What this means is that they are recommending that employees should wear facial coverings, the CDC, as, as well as I would say the Department of Health would recommend it. And as I stated in that particular slide, if you click on that link, that report that one pager turns into about 14 to 18 pages. And in that report, they, they strongly recommend employees should wear facial coverings and they highly encourage that students should wear facial coverings. So again, all we're stating is trying to put all this information on the table and develop the very best plan that we can to one, go back to our goal providing a high quality education and putting learning back at the center of what we do. But now how are we going to create an environment for the health and safety of everyone to ensure we can still do that? And health and safety is of the utmost importance. Um, absolutely. Um, but again, it's as feasible. I, I really want to know what that word means. And if we, are going to open schools based on the recommendation of the CDC in August, does that mean that we cannot open unless our employees are wearing face masks? I, I just want clarification, please. Through the chair to board member Joyce today, I can't tell you, yes, that's what that means. And I can't say, no, that's not what it means. I can simply tell you that based on the CDC, rec this is what they're recommending um working with the subcommittees and our groups we we feel that we have other options that there are things that we can do in the classroom that would be very supportive uh, but we also see that there are other locations and options where that that may be needed so again if you look at transportation there's no way we can transport only nine students. We, we can't. We don't have enough buses to do it. And even if we did, we couldn't afford to do it. So can we transport just one per seat? Yes. But what would make us, um, but what would make that guideline, we're at least addressing it. We're just not ignoring the guideline. But yes, we're going to put 22 students on our bus but we're gonna do something different. And that something different could be, they're gonna wear facial coverings while they're being transported because we cannot social distance them during this time. So that, that is an example of us not following the guideline, but building in another layer of protection for whether it's students or employees. Um, and on another note, with the facial covering, um, I took the survey that the district provided because I'm a parent. My student took the survey because he's a student. Um, but for the sake of the board that maybe um, hasn't been able to take the survey or look at the survey or for the public, I know it's like five or six questions. Is it possible that we could have someone um, uh, read, you know, talk about that survey and what these questions specifically were. Through the chair to board member Joyce, do you want that now? I, if I recall, it was only five or six questions. Yes. Uh, is that possible? Yes, Dr. Krisner, I believe she is on, she's on the line, Dr. Krisner. Um, and just so you know, 
through our uh, software program, Qualtrex, uh, utilizing that survey method to help develop the COVID, this survey for COVID-19. So I'll pass it over to Dr. Prisna. Thank you, through the chair. Um, the first question asks the, the survey taker to identify their role and they can select more than one. So for example, they could be a parent and they could be an employee. And then depending upon um, the role that they select, they get a series of questions. And so um, we wanna know whether the children are elementary, middle or high school, because we'll, we can um, actually disaggregate the data that way. Um, for parents, it asks um, how comfortable you are with each of these scenarios. Your child returns with all students on August 10th to a regular full-time schedule as usual. Uh, your child returns with all students on August 10th to a regular full-time schedule with personal protection equipment, such as facial coverings, face shields, and hand washing protocols. Your child returns with students after Labor Day um, with personal protection equipment and hand washing protocols. Your child returns with some students beginning August 10th on a staggered schedule, attending school only on designated days to allow for social distancing with no online component. Your child continues learning online when school resumes on August 10th until it is safe to return to brick and mortar schools. Your child returns to school on August 10th using a combination of face-to-face -face and online learning throughout the week to ensure social distancing in brick and mortar schools. Your child completely withdraws from his or her normal brick and mortar school and enrolls for the entire school year in a full time virtual school option such as dual or virtual academy. Those are the parent questions. Um, for employees, uh, asks how comfortable they are with each of those same scenarios, but it, but it puts it toward the employees so that we can take that section uh, separately as we analyze the data. And then the student questions are on a one to five scale and it's got a smiley face emoticon. And so they can, they can make it to a frowny face or a smiley face or just kind of in the, in the middle. Um, it's a slider. In thinking about school next year, indicate how safe you feel about starting the school year using Duval Homeroom. In thinking about next school year, indicate how safe you feel about going back to school with your classmates full time. In thinking about school next year, indicate how safe you feel going back to school with your classmates full time if everyone wore a facial covering and washed their hands often. Indicate how safe you feel going back to school only a few days a week so that your classmates could be socially distanced. Uh, indicate how safe you feel going back to school after Labor Day rather than August 10th. Indicate how safe you feel if you attended school online for the entire school year. And then the last question, and it's asked of everyone that takes the survey, is one to five stars, depending on um, how comfortable you are with, with each of the scenarios. Please indicate how much more comfortable you feel adding each of the following safeguards when returning for the start of the 2020-2021 school year. Frequent hand washing, employees wearing face shields, employees and students wearing facial coverings, social distancing of students, physical barriers to separate people, staggered days so only a portion of students are in the school at any given time, delaying the start of the school year, students remain enrolled in brick and mortar schools but learn completely online through Duval Homeroom or going completely online platforms such as Duval Instruction Academy. So those are the questions that are asked on this survey. Thank you, Dr. Krisner. Um, and I think that uh, from my recollection, um, Dr. Pierce had said we had a pretty good response to the survey. And I'm wondering, um, is the board or when is the board going to be able to um, receive the data from the survey? Through the chair to board member Joyce, the survey concludes on Friday. And we have a very quick turnaround, I believe, and Dr. Krisner can send that information out to the board probably the following week. Absolutely, we'll have it ready the following week. We do have to look at the data to make sure that there's not um, one 
for example, one IP address that put in 100 surveys. So we, we always check that. And then we, um, we want to make sure that we have all of the categories of responses available so that you can see which groups are saying which things. Like we have classroom teachers separated from other employees, for example. So um, we, we will have that ready for you next week for sure. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. I think that's going to be very important for us to get that information from um, the community. Um, the there, I'm going to just talk about one more thing, and then I'm going to um, stop talking for a minute in case my other board members have questions. Um, but I do want to address the hybrid instruction piece. Um, the traditional instruction on the, the slide number 16, where it talks about traditional instruction, full-time, virtual, and the hybrid instruction. And um, just wondering, and, and maybe you you talked about this, but um, just wondering, is there, a, in this hybrid instruction, would there be a component to where students could start Duval Homeroom and, and um, and be put in a class and maybe just do Duval Homeroom with this teacher, not necessarily coming into the school if they're not comfortable with that, but participating in a classroom, in a Duval Homeroom setting with some students maybe that are, that are coming to school, um, some that are just doing this from home. Um, and then, you know, as the year progresses and we get through learning more about, you know, what the future holds, that they can just be trans, you know, they can just come to school at that point. So I'm wondering, have we talked about that and what are your thoughts on, um, not necessarily they have to come, you know, on an A day or a B day or once a week, but that they can begin in the Duval homeroom, staying at home, continually doing what like we're doing now, but then just integrating into the classroom when they feel more comfortable doing that. To the chair, to board member Joyce, um, that those are conversations that we would also have to have with DTU because that would be uh, a change in work environment because as I con um, continue to remind everyone, Duval Homeroom is not a virtual school. It is just teachers being able to deliver instruction virtually. And if they're in brick and mortar delivering instruction, it would be very, very challenging to expect them to also be trying to deliver instruction to students who are at home. And that is why we uh, continue to push that we do have a virtual school that is available. I, and I understand that, but as you have said, the virtual component, virtual, full-time virtual is completely different than Duval Homeroom. Um, and I do believe that um, where parents are comfortable with Duval Homeroom, that they would not be comfortable with the Duval virtual um, scenario. And so that's, you know, just some conversation that I would like to have because they are, as you said, two very different um, learning uh, environments. Um, but with that, I will yield the floor to other board members and um, come back to my additional questions. All right, thank you. Uh, board member, uh, Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll pick up where board member Joyce left off. Um, I have several questions. I'm gonna try to go through them as quickly as possible. Um, as far as Duval Homeroom and versus Duval Virtual, I, I too agree that the idea, and I think that the community overwhelmingly would like to have an option where they can remain enrolled at their school. Um, if for the families that are not comfortable, I think there are, I have a lot of people in my community that have said, what do you mean you're considering anything other than just opening? What do you mean? Um, they they want to come back to school, but there are a lot of people who do not want to come back to school with restrictions, uh, and they don't want to come back to school for safety reasons and um, for health reasons, a variety of health reasons. And so I think that there is a, a desire to be able to have the option of someone in the school building being sort of designated as the Duval homeroom cohort of teachers um, 
And it seems to me that if we're looking at staffing complications, perhaps the teachers are comfortable being back in the building. Perhaps the teachers that are more comfortable with virtual um, instruction that have some other challenges or um, health risk you know, factors, maybe those are the people that might be able to volunteer or step up. Um, I, I certainly understand that those are your, your things to work through, that there's the union to be considered and that there, that's a lot of, um, a lot of things to think about. There are a lot of things to think about here. So I don't mean to by any means reduce all the work and the effort that you all have done and will continue to do. Um, but I do know that that is a, a strong preference um, for my community. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to um, explore the opportunities for this hybrid model um, and how we can push our tech boundaries. Um, I was on a, a conference call recently and they were really talking up the, um, the possibilities of technology and increased technology. Um, and some of these folks, I, I have a feeling will be influential on our state leaders. And when we're looking at dollars um, that may come, they're, they're, it seems to me that there will probably be some desire to, for us to show how we are executing um, you know, creative and effective use of technology rather than just saying, do, do virtual school. Um, and I do have concerns that as we push students into virtual school, that they're gonna be um, very surprised at the difference of the instructional model. Um, so if, if we are not able to execute some hybrid uh, approach with the Duval homeroom option, which I realize, especially for our secondary schools, is extra challenging because they have electives and all kinds of crazy things. Um, although I believe in our staff and I think that we can be really creative and out of the box. Um, for the virtual school folks, I don't know if it exists or if it's something we can think about, but is there an option to have a real live, um, almost like a mentor role that these the students that opt into virtual school can connect with a person? I think that we are so isolated right now, and as we push folks into a virtual space, that we are still able to offer a human connection to our students that would opt for something that would be strictly virtual, um, uh, like a mentor teacher, somebody that would check in with them maybe once a week to make sure that they are on top of things. Um, okay, so that was that. Thank you back on board member Joyce's thought, and I have uh, several questions. Um, related to the slides that you were able to present for us today. Um, Chairman Jones. Yes, ma'am. May I address Vice Chair Anderson's comments? Sure. Well, first and foremost, even though Duval Virtual is different, there is a teacher. They do get connected with a live teacher. It is just that it may not happen every single day. So through DVIA, they, there has to be a teacher of record and that teacher, that is their whole, that is their job. They, they are working with their students through a virtual platform. Uh, the, the other thing, and I just wanna correct, we're not pushing anyone into that virtual program. We're simply stating, if you want a virtual option, it, it, it's Duval, Virtual Instructional Academy. Oh, many people think Duval Homeroom is our virtual school and it's not. It sure. is our way to provide instruction virtually. The, again, we are not opposed of having Duval Homeroom. It is just a requirement that we're gonna have to work with our, our, our union because that is a change in work environment. Sure, sure. I, so, I just wanted to address those two little pieces of information. Um, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, I'm thinking about our contractors. So our transportation folks is kind of one that will come to mind. When we're thinking about accommodations that need to be, that may need to be made on buses, um, are those things that we would provide or is there any opportunity to have um, you know, expectation or ask that the contractor provide the accommodation. 
through the chair to board member Anderson, whether we provide or the contractor provide, it has to be in the contract. And that would be determined through the contract negotiations. Uh, I know that Mr. Soares, one of the things that we've already stated is that they have to clean their buses after every route. So they deliver elementary, they've got to come back and disinfect those buses before they start their middle school route or, or their high school route. So all of that would need to be spelled out in, in the contract. Okay, I appreciate the opportunity for those because I, I think that they're, you know, when we're talking about, you know, the fees, it's not feasible to transport nine children or less, right? That, that's not going to happen. So we either have a contract where you provide some transportation or we have a virtual distance learning situation where you don't provide any transportation. Um, and so I think that that's an important part of a conversation with our contractors, um, you know, being able to maybe modify the buses so that there was a shield between the rows of seats. Um, something like that that might make it a little safer for us that we could ask of them through a contract process. That's what I was kind of getting at. So um, it sounds like there is opportunity for that in the contract negotiation process. Um, I, along those same lines with our custodial staff, um, I've seen and heard and read a variety of things. So um, one of the questions that I have about our custodial folks is who makes, um, who makes decisions regarding the type of supply, the quantity of supply, how much is used during any um, one cleaning process? Is that the is that the contractor and their staff, or or do we give that direction? Um, I believe I know the answer through the chair to board member Anderson, but I'm going to ask Mr. Sorez to address it. <laughs> Mr. Soares, you, you're muted. Well, I clicked it, I apologize. Maybe I double clicked it uh, through the chair to Ms. Anderson. Um, we have a performance-based contract. Now we require them to, to clean a certain amount of square footage to a certain standard. And so what we're doing right now is, is working with them to come up for what's essentially going to be a COVID-19 plan that's going to specify how much cleaning is going to occur, uh, the comments you heard about there's going to be additional custodial staff on during the day, doing more visible cleaning. Uh, and that's really what we do. We And in and, and the, the light of a performance spec, we require them to use either the, the, the EPA or uh, the CBC, which is the Biological Center, Center for Biological Chemicals. Um, those approved cleaners, Oxiver TB, these are things that have been clearly uh, denoted to be effective against the coronavirus. So that's the kind of guidance we give. You have to have approved cleaners. We need to see their plan. We'll approve that plan, provided you know, it has the right amount of frequency, the right amount of touch points, but they're going to develop it, recommend it to us. We'll review it, and then they will go ahead and implement it. And that's, that work is going on right now with ABM. Thank you. So what happens if, if for some reason, would you get a report that maybe they're not following the plan? Then what happens? Well, we, would, we have quality control, quality assurance, and we would follow up, and we have uh, performance guarantees, way to penalize them for not complying with what they're required to do. We would take that action. But, but the other thing to remember, you know, we have had a number of infectious diseases. We've dealt with MRSA, lice, um, H1N1. And so there's already established protocols to go into a school and, and disinfect one area or a large or the whole school if you have to overnight. Um, and we would, that's already in place. So we're really just talking about the day to day functionality of how school is going to operate with the custodial contract. So the, and this will be my last question on this the, the supplies, the purchasing of materials for custodial, so that sort of thing, that comes from the contractor or do we provide that? The contract, we do not provide the product because, because there's a performance-based contract, we buy the service. Just like on transportation, we don't buy buses. We buy bus service. We buy custodial cleaning service, and we have a specification for the levels we want, which are being revised now, um, and they perform it. So we would not actually buy cleaning chemicals. We would require them to use approved cleaning chemicals. 
chemicals per per the industry standards that you know are now in place. Yeah, I think that um, just making sure that we are able to execute whatever the um, you know conditions are for for the contracts because I, without perpetuating hearsay. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that are being said about what we provide, what we don't provide, what what custodians are told they can use, what they shouldn't do. Um, and of course, some of those become rumors that are contradictory to what we are saying here in, in these kinds of conversations. So I want to make sure that the community and the staff and the children um, feel that, you know, the, the plan that's in place for sanitizing and keeping our buildings clean um, and the materials that will be used are, we, we're able to follow up and ensure that that's happening. We are. And in fact, when the custodial staff will be returning on the 15th of June, they're going to come back with the right chemicals, the right equipment to perform, you know, not only the, the summer clean, but also the deep, deep clean and sanitization. So that's what, that's what we're actually working on. Um, and that's what the custodial contractors leadership team is pulling together and planning to do for us. Okay. Um, and then the last question that I have about our contractors is our substitute teachers. So it's my understanding that our staff will be um, asked to complete some sort of training um, on health and safety. And, and I'm wondering if we've worked with our um, substitute um, EDS, EDS, I think that's right, um, on any preparation that they'll have in place, especially as we look at the potential for increased use of substitutes if we are asking staff to stay home if they're not feeling well, uh, how they are prepared for being able to step into these these circumstances. Through the chair to board member Anderson, I'm um, confident that Ms. Schultz, she works with, uh, I think it's ESS, but whatever yes, the it's acronym ESS. is, Sorry. Um, that they will have to follow very similar protocols that we would be asking uh, our our teachers to follow. But I see Ms. Schultz is on the line and she can add any additional information if she so chooses. I just wanted to confirm that you are absolutely correct. ESS is just waiting on us to finalize our plan. They have been very open to listening to us and meeting whatever guidelines that we need. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I'm kind of looking through to make sure that those questions were good. Um, the chair, do you mind if I continue or would you like to give someone else a turn? Uh, go ahead and finish. Let's, let's see if we can get that out of the way. And then I'll go to Ms. Hirsch. I think Ms. Hirsch has her hand up next. Um, as far as making a plan, and I, I've heard the superintendent talk about putting a, putting a plan in place um, when we look at the timeline, let me get back to my slides here. Um, I'm wondering whether the plan in, includes multiple plans. Is there a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C? Is that kind of what we're thinking about? At some point, will we have that? Or are we just looking at, you know, full speed ahead with one plan? To the chair, to board member Anderson, Right now, we have multiple scenarios. Uh, as I said, whatever we're doing, we're going to have to be fluid with it because we get new information uh, daily. And so the plan will be based on here are some standard uh, standardized processes that we feel need to be in place. And as whether I've said this today, we can't do a cookie cutter approach because every school is not built the same way. We have different issues at each school. And so there will be opportunities that we have to put in flexibility or even though this is for the majority of schools, I have this subset of schools that we have to do something different. And that different thing is ABC. So I would like to say there will, there will be multiple plans within the comprehensive plan. Okay, I appreciate that. I just I think that it's going to allow us much more agility and flexibility um, to kind of have backup plans. Um, you know, I'd love to see something that's a tiered approach that has a threshold. Um, as I read through the CDC guidelines, they're talking about um, communities with mild to moderate spread versus communities with severe spread, um, and it's it's a little unclear to me who decides what that threshold is and what is mild, what is moderate, what is severe. 
Um, and what will our plan be if we have one student um, that becomes ill? What, what is the plan if we have one staff? What if it's 10? What if it's, you know, where, where do we set those thresholds? Um, which brings me to uh, something that I've been really thinking about a lot was our medical consultation. And I know you've spoken a lot today about um, working with the Department of Health um, and then looking, of course, at the CDC guidelines. Um, I would be interested in exploring something that is a, that's a more formal um, agreement, perhaps um, a contract for a consult consultation with um, some health professionals that are in the area that really allow us to be able to respond to the community with some assurance that they, these are people that are that understand what the landscape looks like in Duval. Um, at, at minimum, to be able to have some of those folks come in and maybe do a presentation or explain to us what they're seeing and what their thoughts or recommendations would be just for Duval, I think would be helpful, especially as we are accountable to the community. Um, a lot of people are asking me, you know, where's the medical advice? And I think when we say, well, we're working with the Department of Health, Health, I don't, I don't know that that sort of broad response um, is providing quite the level of assurance that some folks want. Um, and so I don't know whether it is, uh, you know, an option or there's potential for us to maybe look at specifically contracting with our, our own personal Dr. Fauci or, or Dr. Briggs, um, that we can kind of come in and corroborate, you know, we've made these decisions and this is why we have this plan. And this is what the threshold looks like um, because this is what's good for our community. Um, and maybe it's, you know, as you're talking about different schools or different areas may, may need different things, that there is a healthcare professional that's, that's there to um, reaffirm that that's the right decision. Um, so that's something that I would certainly be interested in exploring. Um, I think one district has added a whole executive level position of executive director of health something something. Um, and kind of re restructure their whole organization to put some of this stuff underneath them. Um, and I don't know that that's what we need here, but something that is more formal that's not just, well, and I know you're sitting on the task force with some really qualified, very competent um, medical professionals. And so maybe that relationship would lend somebody to come in and saying that they would be our point person. And we have that assurance and, and um, accountability back to the community that there is a healthcare professional on our team to help us make these decisions. Um, is that something that we've thought about or something that uh, we could be open to? Through the chair to board member Anderson, um, that is what we are doing. Uh, our director of nurses, Elizabeth Truso, is the, the absolute link between us and the Department of Health and it is the Department of Health who actually dictates what we do. If we have to close this, for example, last year at Jack's Beach, we had to take direction from the Department of Health about what to do about that situation where a student had, had a virus. They gave us our guidelines. We followed all of those guidelines. We, we were able to connect who, what other students may have been in contact with this student and they have a formal procedure about whether we would close a classroom, close a school. So our direction is coming from the Department of Health um, when it talks about the decision tree, what would happen. Um, everything that we've included in this PowerPoint and related um, comes from me sitting on that task force with the medical, uh, Dr. Haley, uh, con we show him, this is what we're thinking. You Please tell me, give me what you think we should be doing as a school district. So we have been working. If, if the board wants it formalized, that's not an issue, but we are not making any of these decisions in isolation or in, in some type of vacuum. We have to rely on medical professionals to tell us this is what you should be doing. And even though we address the CDC guidelines, we still have to follow the uh, rules and procedures that are set in place with um, the Department of Education. So if it came out that yes, schools can open, but you must have something different, 
then we have to follow that. And if the board would like to hear from medical professionals, we have no problem setting that up as well. But we are not making any decisions as it relates to what PPE we should be using, um, how we should social distance, uh, whether children should be mobile or should we keep them in static so that they're kind of around the same group of children for the majority of the day. Uh, much, and I say much, but probably almost all of it is coming based on medical professionals. As I stated earlier, I also sit on the FADS medical task force. So I've talked to 15 pediatricians around the state uh, seeking advice. So everything we're doing is based on uh, research or information we're getting from medical professionals. I, and I certainly appreciate that. I don't, I don't need to discount it. I have a relationship with you. I have a relationship with the executive leadership team and, and I have faith and trust um, that these things are, you know, the, the decisions and the plans are well informed. I think that the number one question that I get from folks out in the community is where's the medical advice? And so there are times when I think as, as educational experts, we have to allow someone else to be a bit of a face or a front man to, to explain that this is based on medical um, advice. And so whether that is in a presentation to the board, as a conduit to our community members, um, or whether that becomes a more strategic part of our communications plan, um, I definitely think it's something worth considering because right now, as much as the community trusts you, um, the second question is that's great, but what is the, where's the medical advice? Um, what, what is the medical opinion? So I, I would support um, something that kind of put a face to, um, to the recommendations from a healthcare perspective, um, which brings me to the communications plan. Um, and I was wondering if we had, I see the phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. Is there a timeline for that? Like when we think that these phases will be rolling out? Through the chair to board member Anderson, um, that timeline has not been fully fleshed out as to when these phases um, roll out. It, it really goes back to the, I think it was the second slide, that whole formation and validating before um, we are fully infusing the communications plan. So at this time, it's still, a it's still not in a semi-concrete stage. I wanted Dr. Pierce to share sort of how we will communicate once this plan has been into, into a formation that we feel like we've moved forward with the board and, and we now then need, need to move forward with more information. Again, for us, we know that we have to be very flexible. This is this is not my, the normal way we do things. Normally we would have, oh, by this date we will do this, by this date we will do that. And as you see, like, like I said, on the weekend we found out, oh, summer camp, that was announced. So we have to, okay, how do we now pivot and incorporate that? We have, a, I know we have a meeting next week with all the superintendents uh, and hopefully we will have more information at that meeting. We're, we're, we are trying to build the airplane as it is flying and pieces are falling off and we try and go out there and grab those pieces and put it back on the airplane. So, um, but again, we have no problem. I'm sure one of the doctors or uh, that um, is on the committee that I'm serving on for the city and I believe Ms. Hershey was on a phone call with this doc, Dr. Haley, who is the Dean of Medicine for UF and works at UF Health, um, would have no problem, I believe, coming before the board or when we do live presentations, making sure I have a medical expert there. I know that the Department of Health, they're, they are more the entity that wants to be in the background. I, will, I'm, I'm, I think I'm comfortable saying they they are the ones to regulate what we're doing. 
they they are the regulators that say, oh, you have this situation, have you done this, 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 and this is your next step you're supposed to do. But whatever will make rolling this very challenging plan out be um, as smooth as possible and people know information as quickly as possible, that's what we want to do. I appreciate that. I, um, I think that in this time when people have very little control, that information provides them this sense of control. Um, and so even when we say there's no information, we don't have any new information, that's information, right? No new information is information. And so I think um, I appreciate that Dr. Pierce is looking at, you know, stepping up our communications plan to something that's more frequent um, as we get closer, because I think people are hungry for it. When we leave gaps of time for people to start, you know, letting their minds wander and speculate and become fearful without direction and guidance, um, then we, we accidentally stumble, I think, into, um, you know, problems. And so, I really appreciate having a medical professional be someone that would be willing to be a face or a spokesperson. I realize that may not be the Department of Health, but even our, our nursing person being present might be helpful. Um, I would love to, to have a community figure or like a doctor come in. Um, but whatever we're doing, just making sure that, that communication is frequent and consistent because people are worried. Um, people are fearful. Um, I'll leave that. I'll leave that communications and making sure our timeline. Oh, no, I don't want to leave that. What is, what is the role of the board in this communications? And have you given thought to what we can or uh, should do as far as our community presence? Um, I know it's a little strange doing community me meetings, um, but when we're looking at being able to solicit feedback, I don't think we should be afraid of feedback. Um, I think we should embrace all of it because it gives people a catharsis to be heard. Um, to feel like somebody cares about their ideas and opinions. I think most of the time people realize the decisions we have to make are very, very challenging and they wouldn't trade us for the world. Uh, they don't wanna be sitting in these seats, but they certainly have opinions. Um, and so you know, just kind of giving people the opportunity to be heard, um, is that something that would be helpful during this time? Are we looking at creating more or follow-up surveys as we move forward? To the Chair to board member Anderson, I'm sure there will be opportunities for the board to engage, especially their communities. Um, we have a number of things happening all at the same time. We have right. the issue with dealing with our budget, the referendum, and this. So I think right now, Tracy, and I'm gonna speak on behalf of Tracy, um, the main focus was how do we first get this plan ready to present and communicate? And then I really think he will work with each of you to determine how do you think best you want this shared with your uh, community and the involvement, the level of involvement of, of each board member. I appreciate that. I think that, um, you know, this is an interesting opportunity as we get these plans together to, um, you know, kind of piggyback on the We Have That campaign, COVID edition, um, where we get to say, you know, this is what we're offering to students, and this is what's going to keep your child safe, and this is how we're going to be flexible and move through this time. I mean, it really is a good opportunity to highlight the strengths of the district, um, as long as we're able to get those communications pieces out there. Um, that could be a cool social media campaign to, to say, you know, this is all the things that we have in place. But, um, okay. I sent over some things on social emotional learning in an email, so I won't do that here. And I appreciate um, I appreciate all of the hard work on this. This is a lot, a lot to think about. Um, I don't think that the community at large has any idea. Um, so thank you, thank you for putting it together. And I hope that you know our work groups will continue to be creative and ambitious. All right. Thank you, uh, Board Member Hershey. We, we've spent a lot of time um, on this so far, and I don't want to take up um, more time because it begins to get a little exhausting. 
Um, I think that it's clear that our community is going to be divided no matter what we do. Uh, if we go back uh, and open schools up, um, there are going to be some who don't want to send their students. Um, if we if we don't open schools up, there are going to be people who want to send their students. I have a nephew entering kindergarten, a niece in middle school, and a niece in high school. So you can you know imagine I'm hearing from family members. You know my uh, nephew entering kindergarten. Should I keep, keep him at home? My niece is ready. Am I am I both of my nieces are ready to get back to middle and high school? And I know that um, our team, uh, Team Duval, is addressing that. Um, Dr. Green, I appreciate the work that's been done. Uh, my only statement really is, is that we're dealing with so much uncertainty that uh, when I get emails from people, my response is that decision hasn't been made yet. Um, and the question about face mask, I just shared, if we are going to provide transportation, uh, we're going, students who ride the bus may have to wear a mask. That's an example. No decision has been made. And the, typically the response is, thank you. So I have answered uh, a lot of questions with uh, that decision hasn't been made. Um, and, but there may be times if social distancing is still in place where, you know, students may need to wear a mask, but those decisions haven't been made. And I've typically gotten, uh, well, I have always gotten a good response. Um, with that, I just think that we have to keep in mind, and Dr. Green, I appreciate you um, letting people know about Duval Virtual School, um, and I appreciate your openness to um, continuing to keep in place Duval Homeroom, because my concern is that when students in a district um, choose to stay home, if, if they left their neighborhood school and went to Duval virtual, yes, the districts retained them, but when a school loses five students or six students, that can impact a resource teacher. Uh, a, a school losing 20 or 30 students would have, could, could be a couple of classroom teachers. And that is my concern when I talk to principals uh, in my district is, how do we service those parents and students who, who want some hybrid sort of approach or ability to stay connected to their neighborhood school um, without going to that virtual. And I know that that's a tough um, piece to hammer out, but I do think it's worth considering because I know it will have a great impact, um, at least on schools in my district, uh, if, if five or six or 20 students at any school or more uh, decide to go with a virtual option, it would have a great financial impact. Um, you know, Dr. Green, I appreciate all of your work and conversations that you're in with the medical community. Um, I appreciate you um, joining that call with UF Health. I just felt like it was very important um, since there were other city leaders on that call for there to be representation from the school district. Um, and uh, I had gotten that invitation and I'm glad that you got it. And I hope that for future meetings, whether you can a attend or someone else from, from your staff can attend, um, it would be very helpful. It's been very clear to me on those calls that I get the impression that face masks is gonna be a part of our for fall wardrobe. Um, but I think we don't know right now because we're only in the, the beginning stages and that's where the uncertainty with people getting so frustrated, I think is that until we see the impact of Memorial Weekend, until we see the impact of the summer camps that have resumed, I don't think we're gonna have a lot of direction and we really are gonna have to wait till July. But anyway, Dr. Green, thank you for your work and I just encourage you to continue to think about how neighborhood schools may have an opportunity to incorporate on some level um, Duval home room so that our neighborhood schools are not greatly impacted uh, by parents who may want um, a, a hybrid approach to education. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Hershey. Anyone else? Uh, there, Ms. Uh, Board Member Willie. Yeah, I appreciate the, the conversation. It's been, uh, a lot of the questions that have been brought up have been things that I've been thinking about. Um, real quick, uh, just a clarifying, I know in the survey it talked about a hybrid hybrid approach where we start Duval homeroom and then move into it. 
but on the slide it didn't mention that directly it said the hybrid was kind of a, a staggered so i want to just get clarification on that real quick i think that's a simple simple one and that's through the chair to dr green through the chair to board member willie when we say hybrid that's anything added than just being totally at school so a hybrid could be today you're at school tomorrow you're on duval home run or if the governor says I want to start school August 10th, but it can't be in school facilities until after Labor Day. Then everybody starts on Duval Homeroom, and then after Labor Day, we would transition back to school. So hybrid just means we're using face-to-face -face and some type of virtual. That makes that makes sense. Yeah, and 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 I think that what's What's so, uh, and it's interesting times because there's inherent risk with anything that we do. I mean, even staying at home, having kids pick up computers, there's always risk involved. And I think what you're trying to do, and I appreciate the staff, is like mitigating as much risk as possible for not only students, but also staff. So I appreciate that. I also want us to think about the sort of the differences in each of our communities and even within our different board districts. Bus riding, for example, some schools have a huge number of bus riders. Uh, some walk, some car riders. So you even have some, some definite inequity there when you think about students that are going to be able to actually get to school. Um, so those are things I'm sure Dr. Green is thinking about too. Those are things that I'm thinking about as a board member for my area with schools that have a huge population of students who are catching that bus, getting to school um, and making sure they're doing that. And even social distancing on the way to school. Like you're in your neighborhood, you got a whole bunch of friends you walk to school with. How are you social distancing from point A to your from your house to the, to the school and who's monitoring that? So so many different things to think about. The last point that I'll make and um, is where does the board come in when it comes to is this does this come to us for a vote? Is this come to us as a plan that you recommend and we say yep we agree with it or not? Because once again, I guarantee you each of our constituencies are different too as they're thinking about this and how do we make that decision in the best way? where everybody's voices are heard. And um, I know we're doing surveys and whatnot, but how does that process work? I don't know if there's a policy in place or I know we've never been through this before, but I'm just wondering what is our sort of ability or accountability here when it comes to making that decision on opening or, or pausing or whatnot? Through the chair to board member Willie, it really has to interconnect with other policies and processes that are currently in place. So we have a code of student conduct. If we decided, if this is an example, if we decided it was mandatory to wear facial coverings if you rode the bus, the other part is, well, what do you do when they don't wear it? It, it better be in your code of student conduct of what you do. Therefore, that policy would come before the board to make a determination whether the board was going to approve that or not. That is an example. I hope no one walks out here and says that that, that, is, that is what has been decided. But we, we have to take this most unique situation that no one's ever been in and figure out how do we build a plan but tie it back to the normal way we process anything. Um, and when I say normal, it just means we have these infra we have this infrastructure in place. And now this new normal has to come. Either we have to change the infrastructure or the plan has to conform within the infrastructure, or you have to do a combination of both. Um, we may decide. We are highly encouraging that students wear facial coverings and um, no student will be penalized if they don't, uh, then that is in the plan. I would never submit a plan to the state that we haven't at least workshopped or shown the board this is, this is what we're doing. Because for that, that may be guidelines that we are giving. There are other times that I may come and say, you know what, this is what we want to do, but you have a policy over here that either you need to amend the policy or you need to tell me you can't do that because you want to keep this policy. Or we we may come across things that we that there is no policy. So we may come to the board and say, we think you need to develop a policy 
And since I just said that, I know that Ms. Young is in the process of working uh, a timeline to review policies so that we're going to develop things that we've never encountered and we that in the back of someone's head is going to come you know I never even considered that Karen may say hey we look I looked at your plan and here are things that are potential policy um, issues that need to be addressed or through policy and compliance they may say we need to address this so the plan really has to uh, drive what needs to be addressed, whether it is through a board policy or, or the board needing to approve this, but whatever we're doing, I feel like we have to tie it into our current infrastructure, such as things as the uh, code of student conduct or um, hiring policy. I think one of the slides talked about you may you, ne you need to look at your lead policy and you may have to amend that. So the, again, the, the concern I have is that we are finding we have to be very fluid. Like I said, one day we wake up and there's an announcement. We have to be able to turn on a dime and be able to manage that. And I just want to build a plan that would be cohesive and tie into the infrastructure we have in place and, and the policies that are in place. But it also has to be a plan that if things change, if I have to, I mean, it's already in board policy that I have the authority to close the school, but what if I'm, I'm just closing a classroom down? That's never, I don't know when that's ever been done, but I'm sure it has. And we have procedures on doing that. Um, so I don't know if I fully answered your question, but the answer is it's complicated. It, yeah, it's a very complicated <laughs> answer. Uh, I, yeah. You know, we're, we're, that PowerPoint could have been 10 more slides that says we need to consider this. We need, we need it to, let's take care of the big ticket items first. And then as we take care of each of those, we keep seeing all these smaller ticket things. Oh, you need to think about this. How does this impact school choice? I chose a magnet program, but I'm not comfortable, and now I'm going to be online. Do I lose my Do I lose my magnet seat? See, these are the these are the things that keep falling out of going through this comprehensive plan. And so that that now is we got to go back to board policy. What does that say? Or do we need to come back before the board and say we believe you need to waive this policy because we think it would be best to give parents the comfort, you don't lose your magnet seat, you can go virtual. It'll be there when, when you feel comfortable, your seat's still sitting there waiting for you. Yeah, you know, those are just little examples of the myriad of decision key levers that just keep popping up as we work through this process. Yeah, I know that each question breeds about 10 to 15 more questions and I, I totally understand that. So I appreciate that answer. And I, get, I think that leads me to with say, say there, cause that question has come up about the going to Duval virtual, then keeping my magic slot. Where are we, are we keeping a list of these questions? Maybe, maybe those open-ended questions from the survey, keeping a list of those. So the public can see them, we can see them and have the answers to them. That would be my first question. And then a last thing, and I'm going to stop and let whoever next go is what I've been doing for my constituency is I know that every meeting that we have, we're getting at least some update from you. So that's the kind of guidepost that I'm giving them saying, all right, we're having a workshop this day. I'll put, even if it's no, nothing to report, here's what it is. I know we're having another workshop, a board agenda meeting in June, another workshop in June. So I'm kind of giving those a sort of at least minimum and it's been helpful. So people to board member Anderson's point are sitting with bated breath, like what's, what's happening. So, cause I know like we don't know, a lot of folks don't know, but at least I can say, yep, at this point, I'll give you an update. So that that's kind of a statement. But then the other piece is like, are we keeping a bank of these questions? And then I'll I'll uh, take the rest off. Uh, through the chair to board member Willie, the survey does, I don't believe it has open-ended questions for them to write. However, many people have, have openly emailed me. So we keep those, but 
Scott the Prisoner is on, but I don't remember seeing an open-ended question. I just don't remember seeing it. There were there were no open-ended questions on the survey. It's just when you have that many responses that they're difficult to, to um, keep track of because people will put all kinds of things in that section. So no, we did not. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, Board Chair. Member Smith Juarez. Um, Chair, um, never mind. Pardon? No, I'll let Ms. Smith Juarez go. Through the Chair, Superintendent, did you have something you wanted to add? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, um, I just, as I stated, we have to turn on a dime. Um, it was just announced by the mayor that they're reopening public pools, which many public pools are on school board property. So here's an, this is what I'm talking about. I, I didn't wake up this morning to it, but it just popped up on my phone that we have to be able to turn on a dime. And so now we have actually board, through board process, our campuses are closed until June 30th. So, that's why I say this is complicated. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And um, when when you were talking about trying to build the airplane as we fly it with parts falling off, um, I thought to myself, we may tomorrow figure out we need a boat. So um, it's, uh, it, it is a constantly evolving process and I very much appreciate um, all of what staff is thinking through and um, everyone who we have engaged both, you know, within our, our district staff and also all of those partners who are helping to think through these things um, as, as we are able, as I said to the superintendent um, when we were talking recently, I used to think that um, the calendar committee was the worst assignment that you could possibly have in, in the, the uh, school school district process, but um, now to, to Ms. Hershey's point about it just really being um, nearly impossible to keep everybody happy and uh, follow all of the necessary protocols and safety guidelines. Um, I, I think being on one of the committees that are making recommendations around these things, um, not to make light of it, but uh, is probably more thankless than the calendar committee. Um, so, um, I, you know, really appreciate everybody who is informing those discussions. I agree with uh, board member Anderson that it would be helpful. Um, I think both for us as a board and, and also for the public to be able to hear directly from some of those medical professionals who are informing the process. Um, we're, we're all keeping informed of that through conversation with the superintendent and others, but I think it would be helpful to the public um, to have a presentation from uh, the, the appropriate health professional, whether that is uh, the, the health department or um, an individual from the mayor's task force or, or the other task force uh, superintendent that you mentioned. I do think that that would, would be helpful. Um, you know, I have, uh, through the presentation today, kind of also, um, been thinking through, and I think it would be very helpful, um, Superintendent. You mentioned several times that you know there are, there are a number of factors that play into which decisions we're making and and how we're making them, and which decisions are ours to make. Um, so it kind of goes back to the the management principle of you know I decide, we decide, you decide. Um, there are some decisions that are being made for us as a district, um, whether that be by state policy, federal policy, uh, you know, recommendations that come um, or statutes that exist outside of um, our decision-making power. Uh, an example of those that the superintendent referred to today is the hard corners in our classrooms. Um, that is not something that, that we decide. We determine where they are, but we don't decide whether or not we're going to have them. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, it would be helpful as we walk through this process that we're very clear about which are those decisions um, that are decisions that are being made for us that we are simply responsible for implementing. 
Uh, and then there's the we decide where it may be, you know, some input from the school district, but also some input from the public health department, from city services, from state, from CDC, you know, from others. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's really clear, it's really helpful to understand when it's we decide who are the informants to that decision um, and, you know, who's whose voices are um, kind of louder in each of those decisions. So if it's a health decision, the public health, even though it's a we decide, the public health department is gonna have a very loud voice in that decision because it's about health and safety. If it's a, if it's a curriculum or an education delivery question, I would think that our voice as a school district is gonna be a loud voice in how that decision is made. Um, and then there's the, the you know, you decide, or, or in this case, it's, you know, we decide as a district, those decisions that we make internally, that we are, um, you know, necessarily getting community feedback and that kind of thing, but that we have sole control over those decisions. Um, and I think it's important that we communicate, you know, which are those things that are being decided for us? What are we collectively deciding with partners? And, and what are we deciding um, internally as we go through this? Because um, I know as I have conversations with the public and with constituents, that that's really helpful information for them to have also, um, so that they know where the decision points are and, and who's making them um, so we just ask, you know, sort of as we move forward with this, that we think through those things. Um, I, I really appreciate the discussion today. I appreciate a lot of the questions. It's helpful for me to hear um, from some other board members what they're hearing um, and who they're hearing it from, you know, kind of what are the conversations that are going on. I know all of us are having them um, outside of these meetings, and so it's helpful to have those. I think my big takeaway from today, and want to again thank the superintendent for involving the board in um, the, the conversation and the process that's moving along, but is um, we are assessing everything, but we don't know much yet. Um, it is sort of how I would summarize the conversation that we're, we are trying to understand every scenario so that when decisions have to be made, we can make them with the best available information that we have. And there may be new information that comes moments after we make a decision. Um, and, and we may have to shift based on that new information. So really appreciate being a part of it. Um, the only other thing that I did want to make note of, because I know at least my inbox and voicemail and conversations that I'm having um, have really ramped up in terms of vendors approaching board members based on the um, conversations that are being had about what we may need or what how we may be shifting or doing things differently. And that is spanning, you know, PPE providers, um, professional development providers, education platform providers, training on safety protocols, you know, physical plant issues. I mean, it really is spanning the gamut. So um, I would like to ask through the chair to Ms. Chastain, can you just speak a little bit about um, the board's policy as it relates to procurement and as it relates to engagement of potential vendors and contractors um, and the board's role in that contracting process? Because it's my understanding that really we're supposed to stay out of it until the superintendent has a recommendation beyond, you know, hey, there, there are some ideas flying around about this thing. Maybe you want to look into um, potential vendors for that. But uh, Ms. Justine, uh, could you just address um, vendors and procurement and contracting? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, it's a broad question, but generally speaking, recommendations for board action come through the superintendent. And when the board, like other school boards, when you adopted your purchasing policy, which is in chapter seven of your policy manual, um, for the most part, it's in policy 7.70, but there are other related policies. The board in compliance with state board rule and state statute created a 
procurement process, if you will, by which purchases are made. And for the most part, that function is delegated to the procurement department. So with respect to vendors approaching uh, school board members, um, that's not in alignment with your purchasing policy and, and the way the work is done, as well as the overall uh, system of governance and management where the superintendent recommends and the board uh, adopts or amends or, or disapproves. So in policy 7.70, you have a section where if if the, procure, if the item to be procured must be competitively solicited through a request for proposals, invitation to negotiate, or an invitation to bid, there's actually a prohibition in those competitive situations for vendors to approach board members because you're, you want to protect the integrity of the competitive solicitation process, and it could disqualify the vendor. As a practical matter, when a vendor comes to somebody outside of the procurement system, such as a board member, you you as a board member may not know what is presently out there um, and open for um, bid or proposal or things like that. So it, it, it could inadvertently mess things up for the vendor if something is open um, for, for the district's receipt of bids. Even if it's something that the district can directly um, purchase, whether it's goods or services, and there are examples where there can be direct acquisitions without a competitive process, the better practice is to send the uh, constituent or the vendor, if you will, to the district's procurement department, or if you feel more comfortable contacting the superintendent, she can direct you to her designee. That's the most efficient way to get that person into the system, if you will, for consideration. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, board member Smith Juarez, if I've answered all of your questions, but that's that's my thoughts on how to approach those real life situations as they come up. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. And and I understand that you know most vendors don't um, necessarily know our policy, and I don't think that they are you know intentionally trying to um, circumvent process or you know otherwise. Um, unduly influence the the board um, but I know that you know it's something that in the past that has come up and and that we as board members have really taken a, a large step back um, particularly when it comes to recommending or you know directing any particular vendor to staff um, not again, not that I think anybody has ill intention in doing that, but just because of the perception that can come along with that. So, um, I just, I know my, uh, volume of those types of solicitations has gone way up. Um, so I felt like it was important to, to note it here for, for the public and for vendors who may be listening, um, that. The, the best thing to do is to contact the procurement office um, or the, the particular department that might oversee your particular product. Thank you. All right, thank you. That's good advice. And, and, and the, historically, that's what I've done. I've referred any vendor who contacted me to Paul Soares. That's not my role to decide what we need. That's uh, superintendent's role. So I've done the same thing. Uh, it's difficult to, oh, I'm sorry, uh, board member Joyce, go ahead. I'm gonna change gears for a few minutes. So if you have something that um, you wanna say no, um, go ahead. on that topic. Okay, um, before we end the call, um, I know we're getting close to the um, time limit, but um, I wanted to um, just get some clarification in my mind. Um, about how this process is going to move forward. And so um, what we have really been presented today is with uh, the CDC guidelines. And um, there's, as I said earlier, there are so many issues with these guidelines that I don't think that, um, it, I think it's not practical with the transportation, with 12 students um, per classroom and the wearing of masks. So we have guidelines that have come down. 
we've talked about getting um, a plan together to submit to the state and we don't have any time frame for that plan. Um, I'm wondering um, how are we communicating with the Florida Department of Education um, to, you know, the, the state of Florida has large districts and it has small districts and some districts might be able to comply and our larger districts, districts are gonna have trouble complying with these, um, with these guidelines. And then that piece with the survey. So we're allowing parents to give input and I think that the vast majority, um, and, and I haven't seen the data, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that, but the vast majority of constituents that have reached out to me um, are opposed to masks. And so, you know, how are we communicating if ultimately the, De Flor the Florida Department of Education is going to give us, the give us what the guidelines are for opening schools, um, how are we, communicating with the Florida Department of Education to let them know this, these are the things that our, our community wants to see. Um, because I would hate that we get in a situation where the CDC says you have to wear masks, the survey overwhelmingly says you, we, you know, that's not practical, we're not sending our kids to school, teachers don't wanna wear it. So, you know, how are we communicating with the Department of Education to let them know um, this is the data we're getting from our community and how are we going to, you know, trump the CDC if that, if they can and if that's the case. To the chair, to board member Joyce, uh, again, we are in a state of flux. We, we have weekly tele, they're called webinars, but you can actually speak back and forth with the Department of Education. So, so we are constantly talking to the Department of Education. Uh, I believe that, again, this is my belief that they're not going to tell us what exactly we have to do, but that they're going to tell us you have to submit a plan as to what will you do. It may be that they will say your plan must be in alignment with the CDC guidelines. I, I don't know that answer at this time. So we continue to put forth different scenarios, the level of information that we have. I do really need to caution, even though 40,000 responses sound like a lot, we have over 130,000 students. So that's still not, we need, that's still not saying that that survey is how um, our entire school district feels about whether it's to wear mask or not to wear mask. Uh, right now, we are more concerned about, can we open up school? And based on the information that we've received from whether it's the CDC or the Department of Education, or listening to the Department of Health, we cannot open school if we can only transport nine students on a bus. We cannot open school if we can only have 10 to 12 students in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And even in the best scenario of a hybrid, we could not do that. We financially could not afford it. Uh, I, we have the distinct pleasure of trying to do something that's never been done before in the middle of not knowing what our budget will be. In addition, making sure that the health and welfare of students and staff are going to be a major priority and make the goal of what we're about, teaching and learning. So today was to sort of just open the window and show this is what we're looking at right now. This is what we see out the window. And at some point, we're going to have to stop looking out the window and come out and make decisions on how to, to get things into place to open the school. But there are levers that we cannot pull until we get more information. Or we can pull them 
but we might not be in alignment with with the guidelines that are currently out there. This is our third update on CDC guidelines. I'm pretty confident we're going to get another one. Mm -hmm. I, I feel confident that they are hearing from not just do all school districts. Um, if you haven't gone to that link, you'll see that all 67 districts are struggling with the same things. You want us to open, but we can't if these things are still considered to be more than just guidelines. This is an expectation. And again, I cannot um, say this enough. Our goal also has to be we're going to protect the school district to ensure that we've done everything that we are that was that's in our control to, to mitigate any any opportunity of spreading COVID-19. So I, I understand you feel unnerved because there aren't exact answers. And that is what we are working really hard to, to give information. But when we give information, a lot of times it's, we don't know the answer to that yet. And uh, I think Ms. Hershey said it, people understand. Uh, I wrote a letter to employees Friday saying, you might be nervous about what's happening for the next, and I, I, I understand that. And I just have to be honest with you, right now we don't have a lot of answers, but we know that we're gonna figure this out and, and Google has risen to the occasion in my two years, we seem to rise. Every time a crisis comes, we figure it out and we, we come ready to do what's best for students and our staff. And this was an opportunity to open the window and now the board sees what we're seeing at least a good portion of what we're seeing. Uh, and if you like, uh, I would prefer not at our agenda review, but I, we can bring an update for every workshop on reopening in school until we actually reopen school and we can continue it after that. Uh, I will invite, I can invite Dr. Haley, um, I can invite uh, Dr. Roll from the health department. I'm just not sure she she would attend, but uh, I can invite people from the medical community to to talk about um, what what they see for opening up schools. But I, I it's just a conversation we're just going to have to continue to have and understand we're going to try to take baby steps. And even though the mayor just opened up swimming pools he did announce not at school on school board property until after june 30th so now we don't have to make a decision about that that's been resolved we can move on but we have to be prepared this summer for athletics and summer camp and that will actually be sort of i don't want to say the pilot but it's going to help determine quite a few things because in his press conference, he said summer camps can't have more than 30 students. And it's free. So, you know, what what are we now going to do if we're opening up summer camps? So I, I sorry I couldn't give as much information today, Miss Joyce, but mm. we will continue to walk on this path together. Well, I appreciate that, Dr. Green, and I know that um, it is um, uncertain times and we have a lot to figure out before we get there. I'm just trying to, um, you know, communicate what the community is feeling and what the community is um, experiencing right now. Um, but I do think that it would be important for the board to understand what the weekly updates are from the Florida Department of Education. Uh, because ultimately they have the, 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 to tell us, you know, what is, they're going to expect from, from this, uh, from the districts. Um, and that piece of really being able to communicate what our community's desire is as they make these decisions. Um, so I think that, that um, I, I just want to be 
clear and, and make sure that they are getting that information. They know what um, what are what the people want, um, and uh, that we move forward that way. And I and like again, I appreciate all the work that you're doing in the district, and um, I, I'm I'm hopeful that you know with summer camps opening up and and it looks like we're really trying to open our communities and um, open America back up again. And I'm just hoping that, um, you know, we can find a, a path forward that would not um, hinder the liberty and freedom of the American people, but also keep everyone safe. And um, so, you know, again, thank you for that. Um, I really just wanted to, to get that, um, that picture of the landscape of CDC Florida Department of Education and the community and how all of that works together. But thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Ms. Joyce and Dr. Green. Uh, I think the dialogue and discussion has been good today. Appreciate you bringing it forward. Uh, people want answers. And unfortunately, we can't give them uh, a firm answer at this point. This, the future is uncertain right now. And we have to realize that. There are so many different communities out there. There are those who want masks, those who don't want masks. And uh, the, uh, all as board, board member Smith already has pointed out, a lot of those decisions are not ours. The CDC and Department of Education are gonna direct us on how we move forward. And I just appreciate the work that Dr. Green and her staff have done, trying to look through that window and give us the different scenarios that we may be facing uh, come August the 10th or uh, the day after Labor Day. We don't know which one yet. So uh, uh, the communication will continue. I think uh, Dr. Green has done a good job of communicating with not just the board members, but with the teachers, administrators, and the public and keeping us informed on what we might expect come August of this year. So uh, thank you. We have governance. Uh, does anyone have anything burning that they want to discuss in governance or how uh, can we move on to adjournment? Can I just ask one question? I was asked sure. to ask this question. Sure. Chairman Jones. Um, I know there's been some conversation about um, returning to the board office and I was just wondering about um, how that looks for the um, board staff. We're training a couple of new people. Um, we've got someone who's going to, unfortunately, hopefully not retire before we all make it back into the office. Um, just wondering about uh, what that schedule looks like. It, um, it, and I don't know if that comes, that's my question. Sure. I, uh, like. I spoke with uh, Chief of Staff, Sunita Young, and some others uh, about having our staff start full time on the 8th of June uh, because we do have that that transition that we're making. So I felt like that all our staff members should be in on August the 8th so that, and we and we looked at the distance, the, the six, we tried to make sure there's six feet away from each person. Uh, of course, Lisa sets up front, so it's not an issue. Uh, uh, Zavanya and um, uh, Kathy are six feet apart, and the desk out front for uh, Gail is, is six feet away from Lisa. So I think we are in good shape. And so they can start doing some hands-on uh, learning and transitioning uh, so that when Kathy leaves, uh, we may not let Kathy leave, the reality is, but uh, if she leaves in of September, then hopefully we'll be prepared. And, and of course, uh, uh, Nita is still working part time with us. I don't know uh, when we finish that work. Uh, she she's around the corner whatever day she comes in. But we're that's the plan right now is to have everyone to come in starting uh, June the eighth. So Lisa and Kathy would be in the same day. They wouldn't be rotating. They would come in those those three days or during the summer or four days during the summer. Right, the four rotate. days. Yeah, we'll start, okay. they'll be only be working four days a week anyway, and uh, okay. through the summer months. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Is there a motion to adjourn? So move. Thank you. By board member Hershey, second by board member Willie. Anything else?